Have you seen this? From our arrogant perspective, we think we are living in the current prime of Garfield, when we are just experiencing one subjective perception of this Ur archetype of a cartoon cat. Our reality is a soap bubble. When it is gone, we are gone. Garfield exists as a concept in an uncountable number of potential states, each one feeling as real as you are. But this is only one of his nine lives. Welcome to Have You Seen This? The world's only podcast about obscure, overlooked, and misbegotten media. All discussions will be spoiler heavy. You have been warned. This show would not be possible without the support of our patrons. If you would like to support our show, join us at patreon.com slash have you seen this. For just $5 a month, get access to our Discord and all three episodes every month covering movies you've never heard of, or maybe wish you hadn't. So Jen, we're talking about a talking cat? Yes. Uh, the movie directed by David Dakota as Mary Crawford. And with fabulous special effects. No, well, well, good for us. I hope we didn't rope any other suckers into talking about this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, I have to correct you right there. Uh, this is actually not about a cat that talks. This is about a cat that uses his uh, psychic mental telepathy powers to communicate non-verbally. Um, yeah, yeah. Although That's true. he does have the ability to talk as uh, ex as exposed in Garfield Judgment Day in 1990, but never referenced after that point. Okay, so we're deep into the Garfield multiverse already. This is sort of the inception point of the idea of the, the branching Garfield narrative. Basically, Garfield is everywhere <laughs> and nowhere. Yeah, yeah. This is, he's, this is a, a meditation on the sort of immersive, unknowable, subjective uh, experience of reality as experienced by an orange cartoon cat. Man, I wish we could have gotten <laughs> Carl Sagan on the show. Yeah, he'd get high as fuck. Well, he's a Mandela effect, and he ain't got no wrecked. He get wrecked. It's God. <laughs> That's what Lou Rawls would say. <laughs> yeah, we we brought Bitter Corell along for musical accompaniment because you're such a Lou Rawls fan. I I am uh you know I I love everything that Lou Rawls has ever said about Garfield. And he's had a lot to say. I'm not familiar with his other work, but no, you no, know. yeah. Why did why did we pick this movie? of all movies, other than to just gaze into the abyss. Well, it's an interesting television special from 1988 called Garfield, His Nine Lives. But those of you who, like me, were, for whatever reason, obsessed <laughs> with Garfield as a kid will know that it was based on a comic book, also called Garfield, His Nine Lives, which is kind of divisive in a weird way at least you know if we can't if we take seth MacFarlane's opinion into into the Ugh. equation <laughs> um, why are we doing that i don't know um okay <laughs> what he's just like oh this isn't what real garfield is about well mike tell us about the clip from family guy that you told me about the other day Okay, so Family Guy, you might have heard about it. It's a cartoon uh, by Seth MacFarlane. That's from like the early uh, 2000s, There's some episode. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's an episode where Peter, or Peta, and his, um, his, his pals are in, the, uh, in that bar they hang out in. Mm -hmm. And um, Peter says something along the lines of like, you know what I like? Uh, Bia. I like Bia. You know what I don't like? Garfield, his nine lives. And then he turns to the camera and start saying, Jim Davis, I'm calling you out. Garfield, his nine lives. What the crap is this? It's it's like not. It's like weird body horror. I don't like it. Look at this picture of Garfield killing an old lady. What the hell are you doing, Jim Davis? I'm calling you out. Now, you've made eight years of good entertainment, so I'm letting you up talk this time. Don't you do it again. Anyway, and then, then it just returns to the normal episode. And, you know, as a person who, who gets offended by cartoons, mm -hmm. I found that offensive <laughs> because... I don't think Seth MacFarlane has any business calling out Jim Davis, who is, you know, is at the height of height of his popularity, decided to take a creative risk and create Garfield as nine lives hmm. instead of playing it safe and just doing rape jokes like Seth MacFarlane. I was going to say, why can't we? Who's the boss references? Why can't we watch something wholesome like <laughs> Quagmire raping Marge Simpson? 
it, yeah, which itself that's what I'm saying is, is like Jim isn't that a sort of dimension jumping in a way yeah but for I think that maybe Seth MacFarlane had a bee in his bo- or you know I don't know this could be some other writer in the family guys family guy writers room I honestly don't know but someone had a if bone only we to knew pick. someone who who worked with Seth MacFarlane uh, years and years ago. Careful, but <laughs> I'm not unpacking that. Oh, could, um, <laughs> I know. That's exactly <laughs> right. Um, whoever it was, I think saw or read Garfield, His Nine Lives, the comic, at a formative age, and it was upsetting to them, as it was actually a bit upsetting to me as a child, checking this out from my local library and reading you know, the story where uh, Garfield is a laboratory animal being subjected to government experiments or the one where Garfield... Yeah, why doesn't he just kick a dog and scarf lasagna? Yeah. Just play the hits, Garfield. <laughs> why doesn't he just beat don't give me to death? Yeah, don't give me any of your, like, drum solo experimental shit. Just play the hits. <laughs> That's right. So maybe as a kid this was kind of startling, um, Tim, had you read the source comic before? No, I just read the, you know, Garfield becomes fat, Garfield is still fat, Garfield eats a lot. You know, the the, the top tier uh, pantheon of Garfield books. Yeah, Garfield checks his body yeah, mass the index. Shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Garfield gets fat shamed. Yeah, Garfield takes Lipitor. <laughs> Garfield becomes fat positive. Oh, just, just... Garfield discovers Ozempic. <laughs> <laughs> the cat's fat, folks. Well, these these are kind of interesting. <laughs> right, yeah. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> See, that's Mike the other reason why we had Mike on. Well, yeah, I do have all those yeah, books. Yeah, I and I Right, yeah, so I wasn't I wasn't familiar with all the the variations, but I am familiar with the concepts um because I've read other things when I was at probably an age that was more um open-minded to that sort of thing, not like 9. Um <laughs> But well, yeah, so um, I, I appreciate the concept. Yeah, so uh, but what do you mean, like the the idea of like a pastiche or some kind of like uh, um, extension of like a a comic concept into other universes? Yeah, the one that uh, jumped to mind, uh, which is neither recent nor early, was the um, uh, TMNT's Turtles Forever movie. Only because someone had mentioned it like back when I used to read Cracked, when Cracked was worth reading. Um, and it was just talking about how they had gone through all the different um, incarnations of, of the Ninja Turtles from like the, what, the 80s, 90s cartoon, and then all the ones up until that point. And then the interesting thing about that was they take it all the way back to the like Eastman and Laird mm-hmm. comics where it's not, it's not even a joke. But the idea of they're like all these different ideas of you know what what the ninja turtles represented, and they're all sort of um, you know playing in that same space. Uh, it's not a new concept to me because this isn't the only time that's been done, and uh, I do have a whole uh, digression on just that experience. I mean, hey, as long as it isn't a digression you- on Traveler. Oh, I have that too. Ah! Which one do you want to hear first? <laughs> <laughs> he can't be stopped, but please continue. Yeah, because I mean, we have, yeah, we have like, you know, it's not just Star Trek, the new generation, but I mean, there's a new generation of Traveler. There are hard times. There's the, you know, the, the far future. Um, but the idea that I'm getting at, I, I mean, we just had a, uh, a, a sequel to the reboot of the digression on the reimagining of the Ghostbusters franchise. So it's something that I think Garfield was ahead on in that we are seeing media properties being recycled and reimagined and remixed. You know, the you know, everything is a remixed notion. We've seen that before with Garfield and his nine lives, and maybe he was just ahead of the curve. Maybe Jim Davis was just you know, playing uh, you know, hot jazz and people were just weren't weren't able to uh to pick up what he was laying down. Weren't you saying something similar to this the other night, Mike? Yeah, I think that um I th- I think this basically any cartoon cat is eventually going to do a nine lives uh 
you know, uh, anthology film or project. Uh, I think Felix did it. Uh, I know Fritz did it. Heathcliff, you know, they've all done it. Um, and usually it's just like, okay, nine, n- nine stories about this cat. And they're basically all the same. They're just usually in different historical periods. Uh, but Garfield, uh, his nine lives doesn't do that. Uh, it's, they actually take, they make the effort to set the different, um, different uh, segments, not just in, not just historically different periods, though they do a little bit of that, but like different genres that generally um, you would not take a a child's property like Garfield and do that with, Um, you know, we've got like a couple horror stories in this. We've got like some psychedelia. We've got noir. It's just all over the place. And um, I feel like it's really, this was 1988. So this is the height of Garfield mania. And, you know, Jim Davis is like, king of the heap that he can do no wrong i i think they were he's literally printing money and they're like what do you want to do with you with us mountain of goodwill that you've accumulated (laughs) he's like i'm gonna make something that will traumatize every child in america because every child in america is going to buy this book it's like getting the fucking like silver shamrock um you know halloween masks (laughs) so yeah or at least uh, or at least page through it in walden books while your mom is shopping for a new bra at the may company across the mall (laughs) Yeah, but I <laughs> think pour one out for Walden yeah. Books. Yeah, I think what he's doing by attempting to traumatize a generation of children is a good thing because this is a uh, an entryway for kids to experience new and different kinds of comics, I guess, basically, or even art or stories because because uh, you couldn't sell any of these individual stories on their own to this broad an audience of the you know Garfield consuming public. But Garfield is kind of that wedge. He's the tip of the spear to say, well, the story's got Garfield in it. You like Garfield, right? Well, how about a story about Garfield yeah. where he's a lab animal? And it's also kind of like a little bit of body horror. It's like a it's a comic strip taken out of heavy metal. But it's about Garfield. Right. So, yep. yep. And to, to it's, clarify. It's sort of expanding... It's expanding people's horizons in a way that maybe they weren't ready for. Right. And to clarify the timeline a little, (laughs) although I think I mentioned the dates earlier, um, mostly right now we're talking about the Source comic book, which appeared in in 1984, and which is, and even though a couple of the darker stories are present in the television special from 1988, just generally I feel like the comic has a more adult and dark tone to it than the TV special yeah, because a lot agree. of the TV special feels like like quite a bit of it would just fit right into an episode of Garfield and Friends. Yeah, I definitely think that um, you know, TV channels balked at some of the stuff that was in the book and they had to uh um cuz they are some of the replacement stories in the television special are a lot more pedestrian um not just typical Garfield stuff, but also very typical nine lives fodder. Um, the, uh, uh, although Diana's piano is kind of surprising in that one, I think, but, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not, not a story that you would expect, uh, opening, you know, Garfield gets even fatter again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I read, I, I watched Diana's piano. I was like, I can't jerk off to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll give it a, give my best. You know, my uh, favorite I, compilation was Garfield gets his own TLC docu series. <laughs> my six hundred pound cat. <laughs> yes, that's a big ass cat. Uh, let's see some of the other things in it because uh, I don't know if we wanted to compare and contrast the special versus the comic. I I have to be honest. Some of the segments in the animated series are are a bit of a punt where it's like oh we're doing one gag okay another one or the animated special um but there are things in the comic book that um i i don't know there i know it's a cat book but some of them are real dogs (laughs) 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 Uh yeah i'll put in a clown horn too yeah there's um i i think the well, I, I have a, I have, I think with the, the, uh, the comic book, um, there's definitely some in here that like taken on their own are kind of disappointing. Mm-hmm. I think that as a package, putting them all together, it's, it's a, it's strong, you know, it's stronger than the sum of its parts. 
you know. Right. Well, I think that the um, the art is great all the way through, such that the TV special in a couple of segments like pay, kind of pales in in comparison. But we could probably go segment by segment on the uh, the TV special and then kind of, like you said, compare and contrast with uh, the source material. I, I would say that the art is uneven in in the comic, but. You think so? But yeah, I mean, I read uh, you know one of the comments on archive.org where I found a copy of this that I checked out um, is they they were uh, in particular praising the color and the art style in the last one in Space Cat, um, but I don't. It, it just seemed more. Uh, there's a there's a. Um, a zine aesthetic mm-hmm. kind of going through a lot of this, which again is itself is pretty uneven. Um, the the coloring in the art, I think, is is not as cr- as crude or is not as refined in Space Cat. They they brought in they had a different person do that one. It looks more um, I don't know. It looks just more zine quality. Wow, you know, I Col- wouldn't have called you. any of the art in the comic like zine <clears throat> quality because to me, like zine says. To to my mind, it's like black and white and photocopied. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, yeah. I guess maybe not that bad. I mean, more like um, I don't know. Like, well, as listeners may know, we had to we had to do our last episode in two segments because I had to go watch that Crumb documentary again. So I'm thinking more like Zap comics oh, style. So uh, more underground. Yeah. More underground comics. Yeah, mm. I guess I mean them uh, interchangeably, which is probably not accurate. Um, but yeah, like the Vikings segment in or uh, story in particular that is and it's exciting because it is drawn and written by Jim Davis like the prologue in it the prologue itself has kind of um, I don't know uh, was it Mazzuchelli Um, uh, Batman year one um, aesthetic to it it's it's like photocopied but colored with like watercolors yeah airbrush it's an unusual yeah it's an unusual style that you don't see very often and it adds to that kind of otherworldliness to it like we're kind of in this uh ill-defined reality for lack of a better term it's this is like mm. we're, we're kind of the this is the people behind the curtain who are making things happen and it's it's such a different style from the normal garfield kind where just like this is a cat who sits on a counter clearly like this is something else <laughs> you know tim when you said that uh when you said you're evoking some comments on from archive.org i thought you were going to mention the one star comment from the guy who says that the file was uploaded incorrectly well i mean he's got a point but that's a di- that's a for a different podcast well that's the thing like i because i uh i read through the whole book and it worked fine but this guy says like parts of pages are missing they're replaced with text uh it's there's a bunch of gibberish (laughs) maybe he's just stupid and he doesn't know how to read a book because it worked fine for me he was on a dial-up modem the comment was from 1997 (laughs) (laughs) i tried to read this from usenet yeah it didn't (laughs) work um well, yeah, so the prologue has that weird, like, I don't know, Sienkiewicz, uh, Sienkiewicz kind of uh, look. I, I'm, I'm just throwing out names. I couldn't pin down the exact uh, style that I'm trying to describe, but well, suffice to say, it, yeah, it's different. It is funny reading it and looking at something from, like, a pre-digital comics era. Yeah. Like, every page I looked at, I was like, oh, this was actually, like, laid out and pasted and painted and sketched or whatever like on board you mm-hmm. know at, a, at larger size and then shrunk down in print like it's a very different feel from comics today you can almost see the fingerprints which is kind of cool yeah that's kind of that underground yeah, comic yeah. look like, like i'm describing right but yeah no there's definitely a feel of uh, there's a texture to these stories where you can almost feel like Oh yeah, water. You see the watercolors or the uh, the colored pencil, uh, you know, residue, which you know you don't get now. Where everything's just digitally colored. Yeah, or yeah, the and, and, extraordinary airbrush art later in the book. Mm, yes. Right, and it does uh, give more um, 
uh, uh, accolades to Jim Davis because we only know him as the guy who he draws the orange cat with the big eyes. A pretty simple art style, but if you look at the credits on each of these stories, you see that you know the prologue is him, uh, the uh, lab animal, which is a completely different art style. Like that's him. That has you know the way it's animated it has more of a Don Bluth style. Yeah. Even the the title for mm. for lab yeah. animal, like that's that's going pretty crazy. Yeah. So it 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 reinforces that he is in fact a skilled comic artist just you know happened to uh find success selling out with garfield yeah and especially knowing like the depth to which newspaper comic artists can sink <laughs> like i'm looking at you mel lazarus <laughs> <laughs> like right yeah like jim davis wouldn't draw a comic like bc for example <laughs> <laughs> like and you do see it in and I'm very familiar with the with Garfield up through probably like 1992 or 3 <laughs> when I got mm -hmm. a little bit too old to obsessively reread Garfield books. Like he does actually have like cartooning chops. It's it's a shame that Garfield yeah. didn't speak to you anymore once you became a, a <laughs> jaded tween. I moved on. That's that would make another yeah. story for the the sequel. Garfield's right. 11th life. I mean Garfield is uh, Garfield is like I think probably in some ways kind of the platonic ideal of a newspaper comic because you know it's the art is is good it's in a in a in a very particular way that appeals to children you know something got the big eyes mm -hmm. and the you know just just kids look at it and they're like they gel with it very easily um the jokes are decent you know they, you don't you don't laugh out loud but you get a decent chuckle and uh, it's easy to understand you it's you know you can pick up any newspaper and instantly understand oh yeah garfield he's a cat he, he likes lasagna he hates dogs i get it doesn't take a lot of thinking you know um it's very high concept. as opposed to like but yeah, yeah his character is yeah. that and it's just like pervasive that you you understand garfield like he's he's kind of cultural wallpaper at this point yeah exactly you know it's not like something like you know um uh you know for better or for worse where you're like okay there's a lot of deep lore here that i need to unpack before i can understand uh you know all these things and it's not like um you know it's not like kathy where it's like oh good i have to read like a bible's worth of dialogue in every comic strip no garfield is like he he understands the medium, which is like art and words working in tandem to create a chuckle right. at the end. That's all you got to do. The art only has to be good enough to be in service of that. And Garfield is very good at it that way. I, so I think the counter that you're trying to describe is Penny Arcade. <laughs> <laughs> is that still around? Hell, I don't know. Are they know. still doing that? I think that? they have a big pile wow. of money and they don't care anymore. Probably. Yeah, well. Do you know, I still periodically i will remember the comic strip where garfield shoved a carrot stick up john's nose and i will laugh because in the last <laughs> panel john is saying now why didn't you knew that <laughs> uh, i'll teach him to take in a stray <laughs> i'll teach him to try to feed an obligate where... carnivore a carrot yeah, there's that too there's one where he uh, he gets a camera shoved up his nose, and the doctor's like, "Looks like you've got a camera up your nose." And John's like, "That's what I'm trying to tell you." <laughs> he knows the medium, folks. Yeah, and the the strong visual component is really important to Garfield. Yeah, yeah. like portraying uh, a cat. That's good. Yeah, the sight the the sight gags. I'm saying, like like a cat shoving a carrot up his caregiver's nose. Mm -hmm. That's a good bit. Or abusing yeah. a dog. Right, yeah. He he yeah. Jim Davis knows the uh knows how to use the medium and in fact like there are parts in the in both the comic and the uh and, and the animated um special where Garfield is in those iconic poses, like the ones of like where he's got his mouth open and his head thrown back. He's just like an open maw and he's like <laughs> you know shoving lasagna into it or like he's got his ears pinned back like he's got this he's got a a palette of uh gestures to work with and they're all iconic to the character that's exactly right i agree i know um do you want to yeah. go through the yeah. segments in the comic because i mean i mentioned that that prologue where they're like let's make a cat right and um well we can kind of go through 
the segments and point out where they diverge. And mm-hmm. Tim, it sounds like you really want to talk about the segment in the beginning. I mean, I, I, I could do a whole thing that doesn't involve either of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a waste of a guest. Um, maybe I'll just post that on on uh, on my blog. Um, why make the a thread that, on Blue Sky? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Why not? Uh, thread one of nine. Uh. <laughs> Tim, his nine posts. Yes, that's all you get out of me in a month. <laughs> but please continue. Oh, well, I mean, I wanted to talk about the ones that they did and didn't include because they had the prehistoric one, and that is pretty much a uh, storyboard of what what we saw in the animated special. Um, I, I noticed they took out the George Burns joke. I guess maybe that, that it wouldn't age well. People wouldn't get it. Maybe. I, I don't Cut for time. remember when he died. Maybe he was already dead at that point, and they thought it would be tasteless. I think that, yeah, maybe it's cut for time. The one that threw me, though, is the um, Vikings, the Minnesota Vikings, as it turns out, segment. (laughs) Oh, George Burns died in 1996. Never mind. Oh. Yes. Maybe they just didn't want to piss him off. Oh, so yeah, he was still around. They could have done the joke. Oh, yeah. Well, George Burns and his nine lives. He's been around. Maybe it probably, honestly, they probably just were like, how do they didn't know how to caricature George Burns? Oh, yeah. Because even in the comic, it's just the top of his head with a word balloon being like, this is George Burns. Because he's older as dirt. Yeah. I think the um, the, uh, cave cat Mm -hmm. segment, I mean, like Tim said, it's, it's, it's pretty much identical in the comic book and the, uh, the, the cartoon special. And it is exactly what you would expect the first of the nine lives to be. It's going to be set in prehistoric mm-hmm. times. You know, they always are in the nine lives thing. He's going to going to do uh, and he's going to do like, you know, he's going to be saber toothed. He's going to uh, meet dinosaurs. He's going to, uh, you know, do yeah, caveman it's gags. In his wheelhouse. And so that's all. Yeah. All stuff that you would expect. All, you know, things that you would expect in Garfield's Can I mm-hmm. can I interrupt you for a minute just to say how much I love the design of the proto Garfield like kind of like the round undifferentiated body the saber teeth and like the dinosaur like tail It's a very funny character design Oh yeah I mean it is kind of uh, uh props to them they didn't just do Garfield with saber teeth they did design him slightly different indicate that this is technically a different yes, character the, yeah. um, the, the earlier evolutionary yeah yeah this, this particular story like i don't think it's particularly strong or not strong mm-hmm. it's extremely average it's, perfect it's like for fine Garfield. um because like i said it, it it's exactly what you'd expect um i think it's actually kind of important though because uh jim david in this book there's some wild ones there's some like crazy ones so he's got to ease you into it so the first one you get is like oh okay this is very normal for garfield this is familiar waters i'm fine you know so you're kind of being eased Mm -hmm. into it uh you're getting your like your your uh, training wheels with this one and then as we go forward you're gonna get the weirder stuff so i think this was a smart starting story it doesn't change too much at once you're not gonna scare the kids away before they are they get too deep to you know, before they're too deep, they have the sunk cost fallacy right. pushing and them forward. The, the special, I think, succeeds at this because we have, what, Cave Cat, and then uh, after that we have King Cat in Egypt, um, The and then it goes off the rails. But the comet goes off the rails yes. sooner because it is the one with the Minnesota Vikings. Yep. Vikings in Minnesota. And that one, I squinted and I squinted at it, uh, and I can't say with any certainty but this feels like Jim Davis wrote a different comic strip and inserted Garfield into it. How do we feel about that? Um, that that sounds accurate. One second. One second. Speaking of cats, my cat just decided she wants to go out through the room. No, <laughs> just can't, can't stand these like half-assed opinions. It's like, ah, go you on. know nothing of cats. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Um, uh, I think, yeah, Tim, I, I, that actually sounds accurate to me uh the vikings is is an interesting one to me because it looks like this feels very mad magazine yeah not just the comic style yeah you can see like there's like they have kind of a chick some chicken fat going on in this one um there's 
What do you mean maybe, when you say chicken fat? Maybe explain that to the listeners. Oh, so chicken fat means like if you read Mad Magazine, you notice how every panel has like is packed with just weird shit going on in the background that doesn't really have anything to do with anything. They'll just stick in like, oh, there's Arthur the Plant and there's Port Zebi. <laughs> or like, and there's, yeah, or just um, like here's, you know, a, here's like a, a fish skeleton or like a chicken bone or something. Just like just strewn garbage yeah. all just kind of adding texture or, or filling filling each frame exactly and there's there's kind of a feel of that that sort of feel in this one um even the little gags like one of the vikings like literally wearing a mm-hmm. football helmet as while well, the others are all just in viking regalia um there there's a like there's a bit where the vikings are kind of like they're doing a good-natured brawling with each other and one of the vikings is paddling garfield and the the paddle is obviously one of those kind of frat guy Mm -hmm. hazing panels it's got the little greek letters on it so they're like little jokes thrown in like that um but uh this this segment to me uh feels like it it's weird because it feels like it was like like uh, tim said it was supposed to be a different comic possibly its Mm -hmm. own thing because it spends a few pages like gearing up and it feels like it's just about to get started on something. And then the story just ends. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It has things that are unrelated to like Garfield continuity. Um, Garfield isn't really even the subject of this. Like I'm, I'm looking at the panels trying to see like, was another character drawn over? Like, did they just like (laughs) white out his face and then put Garfield on it? Because he's never really the center (laughs) of attention except for like, he has one page, which could have been they swapped out a page and made it about Garfield. And then he has one panel where he's holding this like mystic weasel relic that they have. And again, like that is like the weasel is important, but that's again, not in Garfield continuity. Ooga. But then it, it talks about these four or five other Vikings. And it's like, this isn't about Garfield. Garfield appears in it, but it in the same way that, um, uh, oh, geez, what is it? That like, you know, to, to go back to another recycled property in the same way that, you know, Harold Ramis is in the uh, 2016 Lady Ghostbusters movie. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not really that. Yeah, this um, th- this story also, um, because it kind of like just cuts off just as mm-hmm. it's getting started, it ends up to me feeling like. The, it's real reason for existence is so that they could draw that one panel where the lady Viking is like busting out of her shirt. That, yeah, that this was probably rejected by mad or cracked. I mean, Hey, <laughs> but, but Jim is like, I already drew this whole thing. I need to monetize this. This Garfield money is going to dry up any day now. <laughs> he was like, this is going to be the next big thing. Right. Trust me on this. You it, know, it does feel like it could have been, like a pitch for something like if not a comic like a, a show in the vein of like that early mel brooks thing when um when things were rotten which is all about like uh robin hood mm. in that era um because the premise of this segment is basically vikings are unfrozen mm-hmm. they descend on saint paul in and modern day they pillage yeah it. they come from 984 awoken in 1984 the actual year, right. not the uh, allegorical year. Right. They're forced to adapt, uh-huh. but eventually their inner Viking nature becomes too strong. Yeah, very and prejudiced against return. Scandinavians. I got to say, Jim, not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> look, have you seen the shape of their skulls? You can just tell. I have examined them. That's why they call them square heads. Right. <laughs> Can I say I'm that on air? Oh, we'll we'll like, bleep it get out. Get some calipers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, and yeah. it does have that same kind of like Mad Magazine ending where it's or like heavy metal. Like this feels very heavy metal adjacent. Because um, then at the end it's like oh, and then in twenty nine forty eight another section of ice breaks off from the glacier and floats down to the river to Saint Paul. It's like what what? Aren't they going to get freezer burned? No, it's a comic, Jen. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like, you know, I, I think the uh, the art style is kind of cool because it is such a break from what we're used to seeing with Garfield. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird. It's kind of fun seeing Garfield kind of stuck in with it. He's a little un- incongruous. Yeah. But um, yeah, ultimately, this is like you said, it's not really a Garfield story and it doesn't really go anywhere. It, it really does feel like 
it was just truncated. Um, yeah, it's a from something else. It's a else. goofy premise to um, to sell to Mad or or something similar. Yeah, yeah. And, like um, it's a, no, it's a memorable. It, like to me, it was a memorable segment, but mostly because it was maybe one of the first examples for me of a Garfield story taking a turn towards the more adult. And, you know, but Tim mentioned heavy metal and it's not, it's not as though they're like, you know, naked titties in this, but there if is only. a lot of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, well, you know, you can just draw those in like, you know, you could just draw like an extra panel of, of Helga's shirt, like completely off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do see, um, well, they took that out and they put in Garfield. So yeah. yeah. God damn I mean, it, get we, out of the way, Garfield, down in front. <laughs> it is, but you're right, it is kind of adult, because, like, obviously we've got Helga in her, you know, her metal Viking bra. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, we have some punks snap her bra strap at one point. We have, when the Vikings are grabbing people, we could get a panty shot of some random woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the there's a plumber crack scene in this, too. Yes. So, you know, for, if you're a, if you're a you know, 10 year old kid picking up this, you're probably like, Ooh, this is very adult. I'm very naughty for reading this. Wow. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm mature. Yeah. And like in that same, that same panel with the plumber, with the plumber crack, you see the, the plumber's client's dog, like urinating on his leg and you wouldn't have piss in a Garfield strip, but there's piss in this. Yeah, even though one of the main, uh, one of the central characters of Garfield is a dog, so that that's pretty important to them. This yeah. piss erasure, man. Look, I you. think. Uh... Say what you want about Odie, but he is dead housebroken. <laughs> <laughs> you will never catch him peeing or pooping in the house. Mm. What a good boy. Now, Mike yeah. is uh, Mike is mostly European. Uh, so I'm curious what his opinion on how this relates to, uh, or how this compares to Asterix and Obelix. Oh, <laughs> as, as an accurate um, portrayal of the, the Scandinavians. Well, um, I'd say that, like, you know, I, I think Asterix and Obelix have a pretty similar portrayal of Vikings when they meet them. Mm-hmm. They they pretty much do this sort of thing. Um, th- there's the one where they they meet like a Viking princess who's like. Who, who except that they uh she's got the metal like bra but like she's also wearing other clothes because they were i guess they were like well we can't just have her just have her in the the bra and the in the loincloth we gotta have the metal bra over clothes because you know kids might be watching which is very weird for like a european production you think they'd be like who gives a shit yeah it'd be Children like yeah, see uh, if everyone has titties we can of course put them in the comic book yeah, you know, they're like, uh, what's his name? The Asterix guy there with like his uh, his cigarette and his like bottle of wine. Oh, we put the TTs in the Asterix. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that at his drawing table, like nearby him, there's a drawer which is just crammed full of naked drawings of the Viking princess. And of, and of Garfield. <laughs> just getting railed by him. Garfield's <laughs> big old titties. Yeah, you'll if you read an Asterix comic, you'll know which character they're jerking off to. It, it's really obvious. Um, <laughs> Cleopatra is a big one for them. Uh, yeah. No, no, no shade, though. But yeah, um, cartoonists are some of the horniest people you will ever meet because they spend all their time drawing and not talking to girls. Truth. Hey, just look at Mike. Yeah. Truth. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, Mike definitely has a drawer full of dirty drawings. Just, just the one drawer. <laughs> you know, I've seen some of them. Yeah. You act like I don't. Mm. You act like I don't just put them on the Internet. That's all. Right. Like, yeah. Everyone, look at this. <laughs> I was like, Do you think that Mike has any shame? Mike's really? thing is, look at me, I'm a pervert. It was like, hey, everyone, I have a superpower. I can make my own spank bank. Look at that. <laughs> um, Smart. But, uh, uh, but none of them are of that uh, Viking chick, huh? Uh, not yet, but, you know. I mean, I think, like, when I was a kid, when I was at the age when I was reading this, it was like, that wasn't the sort of thing that appealed to me. It was like, oh, I don't care about, like, this Viking chick with big titties. What if, but what if Garfield was fatter? I think that would be interesting. <laughs> what if he let's, ate let's do like, more of that six pans of lasagna <laughs> six oh my god uh so this this one is not in the spe- in the in the animated special they replaced this with uh king cat i think yeah yeah i was gonna this say guy... we've spent a lot of time talking about the viking segment from the comic very little talking about what it's replaced with in the, in the special i don't know if you guys yeah, will have because... a lot to say about this one <laughs> Well, a lot of these are just kind of slotted in, um, just barely, um, 
like work for hire uh, caliber things. Like this is something that would have been on like a Saturday morning cartoon show where it's just like, yeah, here's a King Cat segment. Um, here's another uh, uh, bit um, from the, the 1700s. It's just it's just going to last a, a scene and a half. Right. Yeah. You um, expect to see U.S. Acres immediately after some of these segments. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. St- stunt Cat. That is one joke. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, that that was my fourth life. Mm. I mean, they had they were like, out. look, we only have forty minutes, and and this is running a little long. Do do the fourth one real fast. Um, yeah, the weird thing about it is that it, looking at the runtime for this special, it's the last two segments are a third of the runtime. I they they really rush through a lot of these. Yeah. Um, well, King King Cat is like you said, it's a pretty typical Garfield adventure. It feels like it could be in an mm. episode of Garfield and Friends. Um, I, I think as a kid, I would have appreciated it just because my understanding of, of what history was, was that it went from like dinosaurs, Egypt, Rome, colonial times. Now that was my concept of history. So Egypt (laughs) was like, okay, that should be there. That should be number two. I get it. Um, it's more accessible for the Garfield consuming public. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a little disappointing to see King cat and be like, you know, this would have been better i mean if or not better but like they had an opportunity to do this in like i don't know hieroglyphic style which i think would have been an interesting at least given it some visual flair even if the story is pretty pedestrian yeah yeah i think you're asking too much of what the um uh where what the standard was at the time i'm not saying that you're wrong but yeah that would have been if a tough sell, i think I if feel. he had done king cat in the comic book he probably would have done something like that but like yeah as animation it's probably yeah. like no no just but we don't regular garfield in this this the the network was probably like breathing down his neck and being like we got to get that jim davis under control he's a wild man <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he owns the place <laughs> um but yeah having like a story that was told in a slightly different style that's the sort of thing that I think is really interesting. It reminds me of a um, vintage graphic novel from about 10 years ago that I know Mike had a hand in. Um, it's really difficult to find because I think they only printed about like 500 copies of it. <laughs> but if you can check that out, it's a really insightful treatise on comic book styles and the history of comics and visual art. It's it's similar to the Scott McCloud book, but it's... Um, <laughs> It has a it has a much more uh, rougher attitude towards uh, the comics medium. I think. What, what was the name of it again? I forgot. Oh, it was called it was called Misunderstanding Comics, and you can buy it either at misunderstandingcomics.com. dot com. Uh, we have a, a PDF of it, or you can buy a hard uh, a physical copy with a PDF. Just don't expect uh, it to arrive soon because I'd have to get them out of storage <laughs> and uh, send them and to they're, you. And they're they're. Under manually. piles and piles of unopened Lego sets. <laughs> no, I know exactly where they are. Under they're, piles and piles of unopened Legos. <laughs> no, no, they're they're accessible. I'm just waiting for people to buy copies. I just haven't put it on uh, on my blue sky or on my Instagram because I'm pushing the Lego thing right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and either neither of those boxes are open, by the way. But hey, it sounds like I could maybe put this in the show notes if people are curious. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. Uh, yeah, people should check yeah, that out. Dig this out. It's, it's a good book. It, it I was hear. a really good. It it was yeah. It was very funny and insightful. People were reading it at Free Comic Book Day, and they just laughed their heads off. And um, it was only a little too mean in a few places. <laughs> Man, you know, for me, the meaner the better. But you know that. <laughs> okay, well then you would love it. Show. Yeah, and yeah. I did. All right. Um, yeah, so I think that Mike has a great point about if he had done King Cat in an Egyptian hieroglyphic style, that would have been a real tour de force. And I'm not saying that Jim Davis wasn't capable of that because we've seen his other art styles since. And there, he's he's a, a capable artist and a cartoonist. So yeah, it's a shame we didn't have that. Yeah, but There's, instead th- what you get is boilerplate Garfield. Yeah, I mean, there are some funny gags in it. Um, like Garfield is uh, is is pretty happy with his life being um, you know the cat of the king, but a uh, but some pikey uh, <laughs> British guy in Egypt, I guess, gives him the lowdown. He's like, "Listen, when the king dies, you're going to be buried with him." He, but he said, "But he says it. Read the glyphs. The writing's on the wall." And it's like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, literally is." <laughs> now. Uh, 
we yeah, should they... keep in mind that the pyramids were not actually built by slaves or Jewish people. Oh no, people. they 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 weren't built by uh by by people from uh Hull. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently the people who the people who built the pyramids were actually relatively well, yeah, they're well off-season fed artisans. And re- yeah. relatively well-fed and well-treated skilled laborers. But right. in the popular Yeah, we mentioned that in Misunderstanding Comics. Right. <laughs> in the popular imagination, they're either uh, slaves under the lash or Jews. <laughs> Neither right. of which are true. Yeah. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, it is. There's a nice use of uh, the William Tell uh, overture slash Lone Ranger theme um, when Garfield has to make haste. I think they almost reference the stagecoach stunt, the stunt from the movie Stagecoach. <laughs> <laughs> Where um where the guy goes under the stagecoach and like crawls to the front. It's it's where he's like leaping to the horses like from the stagecoach to the horses. Oh right right right. Oh yeah, because he jumps yeah. on Odie's back. Right. Yeah. And rides Odie to the to the site. Yeah. I do and like I have those a... non Odie dog designs. <laughs> right. Yeah. There are other animals in this Garfield world. We've we've only scratched the surface. I, Sometimes that was a little treat with a cat claw mm-hmm. in the comic strip. Was when you would get like a rare non Garfield or Odie animal, and Jim Davis actually had a facility for pretty good cartoon animals. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, he's a man. I guess. Uh, for, and I said this to Mike the other day. I think because I had spent so many years thinking. And I don't know where I got the idea, but my... That's, that's not true. My notion was that Jim Davis had started the comic, drawn it for like a year or two until it got really big, and then just farmed it out completely. Like, had nothing to do with anything. The, the Dan to... Brown model of success? <laughs> right, like nothing to do with the Daily Comic. And that. Um, and if you look at the early Garfield, like, it's cart- it's in a much cruder style but Mm -hmm. as the comic goes on like you can it's like no that's actually like his style like evolving and it wasn't just i'm sure there were people who helped out but it's like no a lot of this is like his art yeah he 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 does it for the love of the art i mean i think in the popular imagination like you know jim davis is kind of uh you know consider you know most people think of him as a hack or like just you know a guy purely in it for like commercial One gain pony. and um yeah i i think uh, i mean i i think i don't think you can look at the garfield empire and not conclude that, like obviously he's a savvy businessman and obviously the money is very important and you know um mm. uh but when you look at things like garfield's nine lives and some other projects like he, he does have flashes of like crazy creativity that really shows like yeah this the this guy does he's got it you know he's he's um he's he loves yeah, to he's create a skilled artist he is an yeah. artist yeah it just happens that one minor facet of his art style happened to blow up and eclipse anything else that he was capable of so it's like may you know ultimately garfield his nine lives is really more for jim davis yes that's him just being like i can do garfield i can do other things too I think a lot of but but you but you chumps only like Garfield so yeah, fine here yeah. here is a caveman. <laughs> the thing with Garfield and Jim Davis is I, I mean you got to respect Jim Davis in the sense that like this is a guy who you know when he created Garfield he understood like I don't I don't need to rule the world. I he's he's not like a late stage capitalist, you know. He's like I want to <laughs> I want to create this thing Garfield that's like that sustains long term mm-hmm. you know turns turns a profit consistently you know for the long term right. so um you know and that's why you this, know they always talk about like how respect. you know as much as, is this why we haven't seen any garfield nfts yeah i mean that's true we haven't you know which is interesting <laughs> because you would think jim davis would be all over that but um right, yeah. he also seems to understand like look uh someone once wrote an article about garfield mentioning how you know with mickey mouse Mickey Mouse is so in your face. You're like, fuck that fucking mouse. But Garfield, even though he's, he's ubiquitous, he's almost like a background feature of American life. You never see him enough. He's never in your face enough that you get sick of him. You know? Yeah. He doesn't like wedge himself in, you know, he, he isn't ironically not like a cat or 
Uh, he, he did, you don't find him underfoot. Maybe he is just aloof and he shows up and you're like, oh, hey, there's Garfield. Yeah, yeah. Also, because Garfield is an asshole, he's much more interesting than a bland character like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Mickey Mouse is part of the establishment, as I think as Ruben Bowling had, had he posted a whole thread on that on on Blue Sky a bat on Blue Sky a while back. Ruben Bowling, the uh, illustrator behind Tom the Dancing Bug, which is a brilliant uh, comic strip, one of my favorites. But yeah, uh, anyway, uh, Mickey Mouse is a narc. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But I think we can all agree. Uh, but we all know uh, Garfield is a comrade. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, now, because in the next... The, Just not when it comes to lasagna. Huh? No, no. The, the, lasagna, well, see, he's all like, I think Garfield would agree, like, look, I agree in uh, that to abolish uh, private property. But, but lasagna is personal property. So I can eat That's it right. all. He understands <laughs> okay. the difference. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, the next story in the, in the comic book is kind of interesting because this is the one where Garfield says a cab. Uh, so... You know, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, he's an ally. Yeah, uh, this is, I think, actually the strongest um, story in the entire anthology. It's called Babes and Bullets, and it which is which later got its own special. It did. So this actually got spun off into a separate special, um, and it's a it's a noir parody. So Garfield is a private detective named Sam Spade, spelled. You know, get it, get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it is a standout uh, a a standout digression amongst a book of digressions. Yes. Yeah, this one is not a comic. It's actually written in prose uh, with some nice kind of uh, black and white pencil illustrations in a very in a much more realistic style. Uh, so uh, it's a world of anthropomorphic cats that. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like in a 1940s kind of San Francisco, not San Francisco, actually. Uh, it's very specifically not right, San Francisco. Yeah, they do call but, that specifically. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a, a pulp noir story. And it even is told like one because just from the first page alone, and I don't know if this is endemic of the pulp writing style, but it repeats itself not just for comedic effect, but if you're churning out pulp noir you're also doing your damnedest to try and inflate that word count yes and this certainly does that <laughs> yeah like that dust on that desk is real thick yeah right yeah let me mention the dust twice <laughs> <laughs> i just got, i just soaked you for 22 cents my man <laughs> um so this this um this one i think is good not just because um it's it's you know it's it's again they're doing something different because it's like the the illustrations are very unique it's very different from Garfield's usual stuff and it's in prose format mm -hmm. and it's actually a pretty good it's a pretty good spoof of the noir style you know it, and but with the jokes are pretty constant coming through so you know every paragraph's got mm -hmm. a, a couple uh, so it's it's chock a block with with uh, chuckles. Um, yeah, and and that the art is such a departure from what you're expecting, although it is by a different artist, so it's like, well, you know, I, I guess it's kind of a gimme. Yeah. But yeah, it is such a different depiction of Garfield in this context that I'm like, hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, I also think this one is interesting because as a noir parody, it, it also works as an actual mystery, which is very refreshing because every time that you read anything that's either a, a, a noir parody in fact even most noir even most mysteries are not actual mysteries you know they they pretty much tell you right off the bat like who the who the villain is um it's like when i saw like who framed roger rabbit and judge doom walks in it's like what well, was that guy you know duh <laughs> um, this one there is an actual mystery with suspects and garfield has to use like facts and logic to figure out who done it so yeah, i actually really mm. like that about this one um i mean there's a central mystery to dead men don't wear plaid let's just keep that in mind <laughs> 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 once once you find out what fuck is <laughs> uh, this one also well, well, see, it's when a man and a woman <laughs> <laughs> uh this one also is interesting because the uh i think it it gets a little spicy the the murderer is a priest which I think yeah. took some balls to kind of do that. He doesn't touch any kittens, yeah. though. No, well, he's Greek Orthodox, so. Ah. Oh, yeah, because yeah, I, you... I think in the Greek Orthodox church they can get married, so they don't necessarily have to turn to yeah. children. 
Now, yeah, you couldn't get away with that with the Hays Code. No, no. <laughs> now, it is interesting because in the special that they based on this, they did it a little differently because it's in the normal... Because that special, basically, Garfield is having a daydream about being a detective. And so, you know, it's all his dream. But it's um, it's done in the normal Garfield style. Garfield just looks like Garfield in a trench coat. But all the other characters are just human. So... Garfield's going around uh, interacting with humans and they're interacting with him and they're not, they never bring up the fact that he's a cat, you know, which means that all the cat pun names, which are in this, which makes sense because they're cats are just mm-hmm. in that. And people are just named things like Tabby and Felix and it's not never remarked upon. Yeah. Uh, but mm. the other interesting thing about the animated special is that they change it slightly so that the mur- the murder victim in because the murder victim in the comic book is a Greek Orthodox priest and his wife his his uh, widow has come to Garfield for for help right uh, in the uh, in the animated special version the victim is not a priest he's a pro- university professor but he teaches at a Catholic university. So hmm. the villain is still a priest, but the villain is a Catholic priest and the, the priest does still kill the professor in this. Uh, so there, well, I think, uh, yeah, we can all get behind that. Yeah. So there are a few like <laughs> changes. They do a few changes to kind of make it so that like it, that makes sense because the coroner doesn't say anything about going to the, to going to the, the dead guy's uh, church. Instead he says, Oh yeah, he, my, my kid went to some of his lectures at the university uh, but otherwise, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, though Odie does a cameo in the uh, TV special as the janitor who shows up, uh, the uh, old Tom in the uh, in the comic book. Oh, Tom, like Tomcat. I get it. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they, they've rated my uh, Aslan naming uh, schemes from my uh, Traveler game. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because I, I had a character called Coleco. <laughs> <laughs> and you know another one called Shoratar. <laughs> Mr. Coleco didn't have, didn't have a meat of sphinx though yeah so the uh, the animated special that they based ba- the animated babes and bullets doesn't have the same style as the uh, comic book but it's I think it's a fairly decent special in its own right um, I hope they at least you know. left the joke in where Garfield says you're fucking like a damn China man <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Garfield is canceled. <laughs> it's not the preferred nomenclature, normal. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I feel like I'm I'm reading the back matter of one of the the Watchmen chapters, flipping through this. But it's nice. It's it's a nice change of pace, so I appreciate that. And then what happens in the special is they um, I don't know if maybe they decided ahead of time they were going to save that for its own special, but they uh, in the, in the Garfield is Nine Lives TV special. They basically just move up the uh, the in the the, in the, the garden. garden one, which right is in spite of being a little bit of a damp squib of a story in the comic, has some really wonderful art of a kind that you don't really see much anymore because it's an, it's it's a it's a very eighties uh, kind of style, but on the screen it just really pales in comparison to the source it's both of them have a kind of psychedelic alice in wonderland you know copyright disney um aesthetic to them yeah yeah um there's a very lisa frank feel to them yeah the the (laughs) the airbrush art and all the little details some of which are there are most of which are transferred directly into the special like you see um whatever the fuck that floating calliope with the music notes is uh, in the, yeah, they name yeah. a bunch of weird shit. S- stuff that is just weird. Um, it does seem like they're setting up a Garden of Eden allegory because it is about a girl and her cat, and they just kind of hang out, and they just enjoy what they're doing. Um, and then, uh, who is it? The the creator of the universe, um, Uncle Todd, you know. Rhymes with God. Right, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but also evokes the German word for death. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. Good. <laughs> yeah, you like gotcha. that? Yeah, yeah. 
Toad there, got. There's layers in this one. Yeah. Um, so they're in yeah, kind of a, a candy land. It's it's like um, it, it's a Garden of Eden by way of uh, the the music video for Katy Perry's California Girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So imagine it's, that um, that landscape. Yeah, I mean you're right because like the thing is the 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 star of this one is really the visuals because they're obviously going for a very specific kind of uh you know psychedelic uh feel which is you know not just in the visuals but also in this this oddity of the story um and uh when they put it in the animated special they're trying to capture that that feel but like they don't have the airbrush look that really sells it so yeah. it just kind of looks like i don't think right. they you know, have like the production time or the budget to replicate that style why didn't they get the uh, thief and the cobbler guy? He's got to be no. He's he's anime. He's drawing yeah. right now. Wow, you you anticipated my joke, Tim, because I was going to say like they could have got oh. a Richard Williams type, except then the this segment would never have appeared. And no, he'd yeah. Have still been working on it thir- thirty years later. What about uh, the uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy people? They could have gotten them from what episode <laughs> was that twenty? Same people, Tim. God. <laughs> or uh, was this that the one bit? Is kind of <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> this one was a little weird though because i feel like similar to the viking segment this one just ends just as it seems like it's about to take off right and um, i was gonna say about that that it is interesting how many of these garfield stories are about returning to a comfortable status quo which i, I mean does gel with the theme of the garfield comic strip you know, mm-hmm. it does seem weird to me that each of them are about Garfield's nine lives, but like the Viking one in particular, what happens to Garfield? And the same thing with the Garden of Eden, it's narratively inert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in fact, it is, you know, particularly called out where you know, Uncle Todd brings this forbidden crystal box on a toadstool and he says, don't open it. And they're like, got it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Which, it. You, you, um, you would think it was uh, my. Uh, a group of traveler players where I say, if you go there, something might happen. They're like, okay, got it. Don't go there. They're thank like, you. Fuck no. <laughs> thank you for wa- thank you for warning us. Something interesting might have happened. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like when he was, I feel like when he was putting this together, like he had really cool ideas for like the aesthetic of each story. Like he was like, mm. okay, this is going to be kind of a Mad Magazine heavy metal type look and this one's going to be kind of a airbrushed wizard on the side of a van type look awesome. and then when he actually came to putting them down on paper he was like oh, oh this is run too long okay just end it you know yeah. people aren't going to pay attention <laughs> to the story yeah just, just being just like the- lisa frank can you give me six minutes of psychedelia and she'd be like yeah sure i guess well think yeah, about yeah. where the story would have gone if they had opened the box well it would have gone somewhere right which it didn't right but yeah um as much as, but it's strange because maybe it was meant as a counterbalance to the stories in the comic, which do make you feel a little uncomfortable. Like if they'd open the box, then like, what's the, what does the segment turn into? I like, I'm imagining like they get Wayne Barlow to illustrate it and Garfield goes to hell. <laughs> well, Shit. I mean, something I changes for now. Garfield. Yeah, yeah. See, you're like, oh, it would be so awful. If something interesting. Here, can you like write that down and send it? Like, I can CC you on the uh, email chain for my travelers. Garfield goes to hell. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, look, something interesting happens. See, you're rewarded when you engage with the. St- <laughs> I'm just. They can't hear you, Tim. They're too busy <laughs> delivering the mail. Right. Yeah. Well. Um, I mean, this is, well, you're, you're also correct that, like, uh, the Garden and the Vikings are share that issue where Garfield is a mere bystander in his own story. Right. Like, he doesn't do anything. Uh, if if any, anyone is, can be, if anyone can be said to be, like, causing anything, like, Chloe, the girl that he's hanging out with in the Garden, is probably the more of a protagonist and she doesn't really do anything either. Um, Again, I think he just, you know, had a look and he was like, Oh, this is gonna be cool. Let's do that. Um, It's kind of a, like Tim said, it's kind of a garden of Eden type story, except without the fall of man. So I guess that 
that's an interesting way to look at it, but it doesn't make for a, r- much of a story, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess it's some that it, crazy visuals. The, the original concept for the comic was aspects of the cat personality and exploring that in these different facets of Garfield, the nine lives. So you get things like the, you know, the cat that is just a complete hedonist, I guess. Okay. Like the cat. um, And, you know, that I do relate to that about cats, that they just like to sleep all day and eat. And sometimes they yell at you. Those are two of your favorite things. Yeah. Right. Um, So you get, you get uh, Garfield, the hedonist Um, in the darker segments. Like those are, those are like really cat like stories. I mean, like you get, uh, because you know, the one that upsets everyone where, where Garfield is imagined as, as turning on his owner. It's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like your cat would a hundred percent kill you if it was big enough. Right. Yeah. Well, the thing is the garden segment, it kind of does violence to the idea of a cat because it's like, Oh, you're telling me that there's a, there's a thing to be curious about. And the cat is like, nah, I don't think so. Right. Yeah. That, that doesn't, doesn't wash. That's true. You would think at least like Garfield would have knocked it off the, the toadstool. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. he's an unwitting, um, uh, catalyst, cat a list. Oh, <laughs> like in, as Chloe in... was saying, Garfield, don't you dare, don't you dare <laughs> push that right. off the toadstool. And the cat's she was like, like no, yeah, fuck you. Yeah. Just, so looks... just no, no. <laughs> No, just looks Garfield, dead, Garfield. Dead straight at her. No, then she just becomes like, uh, like a kinky candy. Garfield, no, 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 Garfield, no. Oh, I would love to watch forty-five minutes of that, just back and forth. <laughs> and you do every Friday. Yeah, but I don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't, Tim is not a hedonist. It's very, no, it's no. very, uh, it's very German Lutheran of him. Right. Yeah. It's my own like mental flagellation. <laughs> it's just watching TV that sucks. But anyway, about this cartoon. <laughs> um so yeah, the uh I, I think again, like I mean the the look is really what is important for this segment. Uh at least just, in the like, book. it's one of those yeah. like yeah, no plot, only vibes. Uh mm. which works just fine in the book, I think. Uh it's doesn't translate as well to the screen because they don't have the budget to really Yep. make that real also they have that awful voiceover yeah i didn't like you know what this mm-hmm. segment should have just been honestly is like look just just have them dancing around in the field and play a song have lou rawls cover uh you know fucking strawberry alarm clock or something <laughs> and you know that you got your segment yeah yeah it, it can be it can be a superior magical mystery tour Yes. Yeah. You know, it should have been. Oh, they should have animated to look like Yellow Submarine or something. They probably could have done that. Yeah. That's oh true, yeah, I mean, because then you get. Yeah, you get the ornate art, but it's in like a a two D style, so that's yes. a little more manageable. Yeah, I mean, I think that would have looked really good on in the cartoon, but like, I mean, it, it's fine. It's not like I, I, I'm giving the garden kind of a pass because I think he was just going for a vibe. Um, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah, but it's much more enjoyable on the page, just because of the yes. the really pretty cool art, like such that I'm like, I wonder if I could do something like this, like in Illustrator or something like that. Uh, Dave Kuhn is the artist, and hmm. props. Yeah. Uh, let's see what um, else got cut. Um, <laughs> in the book, they followed up with Exterminators, which is just a uh, Three Stooges ripoff, which. Whatever. I can see them cutting that for being weak. Right. Yeah. I I think, yeah, this is just exactly a Three Stooges routine. Um, this is probably the weakest one in the entire book. Because it's so weak they should have put in the special. <laughs> yeah, it's like, because it literally is just like, okay, it's, it's Garfield in a Three Stooges routine. There's nothing about the look of it that's, you know, because, you know, the garden has a cool aesthetic that mm-hmm. can make up for its weakness as a story uh the vikings at least has a a neat look as well because it's a little more 
out of, of the typical Garfield wheelhouse. This one just literally looks like a Garfield strip. You know, yeah, um, just an unused Garfield strip. <laughs> like, put it in yeah. the Nine Lives book. There, we're one I mean, down. I don't know if the only I don't know if it's just because I'm a Garfield Mark from way back, and this might mm-hmm. just be like the glow of nostalgia. But this segment and the Cave Cat segment in the book, like I found myself laughing at stuff on the page just because the drawings were very funny in mm-hmm. the way that like sometimes Garfield the comic strip would have like a pretty basic but funny sight gag. Yeah. Well, I like, do uh, think, uh, I like mean... Like, in the Cave Cats... Sorry, Mike, but in the Cave Cat segment, both in the TV special and in the comic, when Garfield is tamed by the caveman, <laughs> it's basically just by being <laughs> beaten with a stick. <laughs> well, he's petting him in the way that only a caveman can. Good cat! It's like, it's like yeah. when you do that thing to a cat where you kind of, like, play drums on its ass. Oh yeah, they love that. Except <laughs> yeah. for when they, they don't. They do, they do. Um, yeah, you know this. This the exterminators. Um, it's I'm being um, I'm being harsh on it because it's so ordinary in this book. It, yeah, like you say, it's a solid Garfield strip, but it's like we just had uh, Alice in Wonderland psychedelia. We just had a noir story with realistic pencil art, and then here's just another Garfield strip. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and it, it is like, like the, and it does feel more, uh, less adult than the rest of the material because, mm-hmm. oh, it's like basic simple sight gags and then in it ends with them feeding a mouse to an old lady and she enjoys it. Like, that's, I mean, that's like a pretty childish storyline that like a kid would laugh at, which is mm-hmm. fairly in line with a lot of Garfield. I, I do have to say that ending is like, extremely funny i mean that actually is really funny uh just that the old lady like really likes <laughs> eating the mice and she's like wants to go eat more mice with these uh exterminators yeah especially because um, like her and again this is another strength of the art like she's so enthusiastic about the about having eaten the mouse she's like that was good <laughs> yeah i mean it's like it's so stupid I mean, it's a pretty it's typical funny. like oh here's the uh you know the what is it the, the dowager who they're going to wreck her house. And then at the end, she's like, oh, no, I love eating mice. <laughs> I love eating dead rodents. Yeah, it's a good um, bit. So, I mean, I think that's a good, I mean, that's a really strong and funny ending. But the, I don't Compared know, this to one's a weird one because I almost feel like uh, Jim Davis was like, okay, look, I've got like a whole bunch of fucking weird shit in this comic book. I need to put in another normal one to balance it out. You yeah. know? It's kind of like, and like, like the, the funny segment in like a horror trilogy. Yeah, Something yeah, like exactly. Oh, yeah, and the middle I mean, segment like... is always the weakest. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, I think we got nine lives, and I think of the nine, um, let me let me see, because Cave Cat is pretty, I feel like Cave Cat's pretty normal, the Exterminators mm-hmm. are pretty normal, Garfield's pretty normal, Space Cat is kind of, it feels pretty Garfield-y to me. So, you know, you got four of them that are kind of like within Garfield's, regular wheelhouse to some extent and then five that are kind of off the rails so i mean i guess it's balanced in that sense but um i don't really know that it needs the balance i mean maybe again if you're a little kid and you're like i need to kind of after experiencing some of these stories i need to kind of come up for you know a breath of air and have a normal garfield story but i don't know for me i'm like i would rather have more weird ones yeah i don't think that there's really a template that they're working off of at the time that's part of it well, especially because yeah. like the lab animal segment would will fuck you up as a child, but um, mm-hmm. we'll get to that because uh, after in the garden we have a court musician replacing the exterminators, and for me the standout in this is the art. I was gonna say I don't know if you you guys remember this, but it looks like in the '90s when they made those fairy tales for every kid, like uh, cartoons. And it would be like, oh, what if, you know, it's like, what if Snow White, but like hip hop, you know, like that sort of thing. <laughs> and they all had this kind of this style. It used to be on PBS. It's a little bit like it's... Gerald McBoing Boing. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I was thinking uh, Fritz Freeling. It looks kind of like the, um, uh, like, what was it? 
when Bugs Bunny goes to the uh, the the castle with like Witch Hazel and Goss Gossamer, it has like that kind of look to it. Mm. Um, I don't know, maybe even like kind of Rocky and Bullwinkle ish. There are a lot more sight gags in this one than I think there are in the other ones, um, because we have just like the establishing premise where it's like, hey, Handel, you got to write a fugue. No, sorry, you got to write a concerto now, and he's being menaced by this court jester. Yeah, what the um, fuck is that guy's problem? I, he's <laughs> just a, well, you know, you don't think that a jester is a profession that would attract assholes? Well, yeah, just look at Andy Dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like podcast guest. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> so he's, this, um, he's I, this pestering jester. You know this this segment. Um, what I do like about it is that there's a problem. There are stakes. And Garfield takes action to solve the issue and save the day. That's amazing because most of these segments have uh, possibly one or two of those. <laughs> well, again, very cat-like because, like, would you expect a cat to lift a paw to help anybody? Well, I mean, you can expect a cat, as is, uh, it comes out by the end of the segment, to just dip its paws in ink and then walk across whatever you're working on. Yep. That is true. They do that, like to do that. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> um, the court jester uh, in particular, because uh, I was saying he does a lot of sight gags. One of them is his mouth becomes a guillotine, which he puts an apple in and then slices in half. You're talking about oh. weird shit in, in the garden. This one has a lot more like horrific concepts in it. What an Many I, threats I, I really beheading. like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this one because the well, I think because the aesthetic of it is like you said, very Fritz Freeling, Freeling. Mm-hmm. That I kind of expect that sort of thing is like, oh yeah, like Looney Tunes type stuff. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah, I'm 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 for it. Um, yeah, it has its own unique style and a, a visual way of telling things. Um, that is particular to to its own story. Um, it is uh, one of the. Threads that I wanted to remark on throughout all of this, we've talk, been talking about, you know, Jen, there's the historical inaccuracy of slaves building the pyramids. There are notions going back to you know, the uh, inception of the Western, the movie Stagecoach, which I think all all movies owe a debt to, except for ones that are based off of samurai movies. But yep, the the even the the court musician segment. The we're we're getting an inaccurate, um, <laughs> bastardized uh, portrayal of history, because the court jester they mention in particular this is happening in the 1720s. This is for King George in England, but the jester keeps making re- allusions to beheading, which is a French concept. If anything, <laughs> he would go in the Tower of London. Yeah, wasn't he <laughs> like German or something? Yeah, I'm just saying. We're getting this uh, this game of telephone through history, and well, hey, maybe maybe I don't know. I I didn't live in Georgian England, so I, I'm just well, saying that I, Garfield's I, nine lives are fundamentally unknowable. <laughs> I I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. I, I, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> then we did also get uh, the exterminators uh, truncated down into Stunt Cat, which is just Ignatz and Crazy Cat. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, one for the. I, I, this this segment is one for like the kind of person who spends all their time at Comic Con at that one like comic, uh, cartoon museum booth, like talking to the oh. like eighty seven year old <laughs> artists there. Ugh. I thought this was like a <laughs> Bambi versus Godzilla cartoon. Well, I I will say that like uh. Yeah, com- comic uh, nerds who were into Crazy Cat, worst, worst people, just the worst. <laughs> like, oh, you know, actually, it's very interesting how like George Harriman had all these like weird backgrounds. Yeah, okay, that's nice. <laughs> oh, you know, actually, do you know Ign- Ignat's mouse is actually gender fluid? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> He's a cartoon uh, mouse first from bi- nineteen twenty. Non-binary cartoon mouse. Yeah. Well, guess what, um, like, bitch? It turns out that Garfield is also gender fluid, as we learn later in the special. <laughs> That's true. And that is canonical. Uh, Jim Davis has said that. Garfield is neither male nor female. Yep. He is both and all. 
Yep. Um, well, no, that that doesn't track with the cave cat segment, though. Um, or, or perhaps we're talking about divergent or convergent evolution because the girl cat species does appear. Oh, Gar- Garfield is a he him lesbian. It tracks. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I, actually, I no, I may be exactly wrong. It is a different species of girl cat, whereas the Garfield species of cat is I don't, uh, a hermaphrodite, maybe. Like, it's a... Uh, it, it auto reproduces. What do they call that? Budding. Yeah, no, it, yeah. He's <laughs> Parthenog- <laughs> parthenogenesis. Gar- Garfield reproduces via spores. <laughs> <laughs> is is a uh, Gar? Well, no, no. Okay, Look, Garfield is the sporophyte generation. That other cat we see, that's the gametophyte generation. The, yeah, there you go. He, he, yeah. We don't know when cave cat took place. It could be 150 million years ago true yeah you know like cats they were very different back then yeah as as they said um yeah, sorry i, mean, have I you ever derailed seen, like, your a horse from back then shit's fucked up i know it's oh, like those, a, a i like those horses dog. those horses were cute oh they're a little tiny yeah. i god i wish i had a pet one so bad yeah like i don't <laughs> mind those horses a tiny little five-toed okay. horse just just yeah. walking on its hands yeah it's so cute <laughs> I'd settle for a pet capybara, but I don't think I can have one in the state of California. I'm so mad about that. Every day well, I'm mad legally, about that. But I mean, Thank you, nanny state. Yeah. 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 Saying. Jen, do you think do you think perhaps that um, rather than Ignatz and Crazy Cat, Jen, would you have liked to have seen a Garfield segment in that style of that uh, what Everhard uh, cartoon that we riffed? <laughs> What was that it's called? Just, it's just Garfield chasing after Arlene, and Garfield's got a gigantic schlong. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got like a little wheelbarrow to carry it around in. Um, of it course, is him like porking Odie through a hole in the fence. <laughs> it's just Odie <laughs> getting getting fucked by like a Mexican guy. Because <laughs> <laughs> Odie does kind of look like a dick and balls. Let's be honest. That's true. That true. I don't know what the fuck yeah. kind of dog that is. You know, an I, interesting thing about Arlene. It's a fuckable dog. Though, yes. Um, you might have noticed. Now, Arlene does appear briefly in the uh, Nine Lives um, um, cartoon, but it's a non speaking role. And other than that, like we never see Arlene in any of the Garfield specials. She's not in uh, Garfield and Friends. She does not appear until Garfield gets real, which uh, I think came out a few years ago and the reason for that is apparently jim davis had a very specific voice in mind for arlene and he just could not find a voice actress who fit the bill so for years and years he was just like no it's golly arlene's gotta sound like this wow hit the bricks michelle pfeiffer kathleen turner get out of here you don't sound like a cat get out of here maureen teefy go right do a voice on perversions of science (laughs) you know um well I respect that because he just wanted a, an appropriate voice to come from those dick sucking lips. Yeah, that's yeah, true. She's she's got look, Arlene has got the dickest suckingiest lips <laughs> in cartoon history. And it's Sucking wasted that spiked on spiked cat dick, yeah. Yeah, it's wasted on tiny barbed cat cock. <laughs> that's why they have to be that big and pillowy for yeah. her own protection. Uh, her her Maybe lips look like that just... just because yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> gross um uh speaking of beautiful things diana's piano yeah um diana's piano this one is um it has a very pixar tone to it which might have been contemporary yes. at the time when they were doing early 3d animation although this isn't this is all what like pencil uh, jen you'd know better than i would yeah it's 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 like um it looks like a colored pencil style yeah Oh, yeah. um, like Lost Girls, that other, um, speaking of Alan Moore and Melinda, what, Gebby? Yeah. Yeah, she did the art for that. Yeah, and like and like Crayon, I want to say. Yeah. Very, yeah, that very was crazy fitting of... when the chick fucked the cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Di- Diana's piano has, um, I, I don't know... Yeah, what it remind it reminds me of something, but I can't quite put my finger on it. It feels kind of Chuck Jones esque in the mm-hmm. animation style, like Phantom Tollbooth era Chuck Jones. Yeah. Um, 
And it's it's basically, I mean, this story always hits me every time I watch this special because it's basically about having a cat. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's what it's like to have a cat. You have a cat, you love you love the cat, and then the yeah, cat dies. You you, you, know? you grow up to be a a hot redhead and go off to music college. It's like you know you know the t- t- tale as old as time. Right? You know? Yeah. It's whom it, amongst us before Pixar's up, we had Diana's piano. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Did you guys know that the cat was also infertile? Oh, oh, is that true? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I like in you know, in up when the, you find out the woman is unfertile. It's like, well, then who gives a shit if she dies? She's useless. <laughs> right? Yeah. She's just. Well, well, I'm sorry. What good is that hole if it doesn't come with a womb? <laughs> She's dead weight at this point. Yeah. True yeah. That. Yeah. But I, the, I like yeah, the this bird one in the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did like the dog in that one. Yeah. Um, no, Diana's piano is like it's very sweet. I I think it's it's a, it's very understated. Um, I I find it pretty affecting, and um, you know I, I I think it's I think it's a very unusual choice for this to put in this special. I would not have expected something this emotional. You know. Um, yeah, and it, and this gets back to my earlier point about how varied a lot of these are because it's I feel like it's Jim Davis the legitimate skilled cartoon artist trying to get like pop culture pilled slobs to try different things this is like eating your <laughs> vegetables for people who are like I'm just gonna read Garfield books and be like well what if you had a Garfield cartoon that made you feel something yeah yeah yeah, um, that's probably where that one, this, this one... Uh, that one weird uh, Garfield story arc that people on the internet like to mention comes from. The one where uh, Garfield finds himself alone in an abandoned house. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember I reading that, that in the paper when it f- came out the first time and just being like, I need to know what happens to Garfield. <laughs> it worked Every day you. I'm waiting for the paper. Wow. Um, you have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that, and that came out of no. That there was no warning no. about that. I don't even think it was Halloween when it came out. It was just a random week of Garfield, where Garfield goes insane. Yeah, you got um, swerved. Yeah, it yeah. Was good, see, though. and and yeah, like I, invoking you know Penny Arcade as I did earlier. Like they they tried that and got lambasted for it. Yeah, They're trying to like oh, get real second. in wait, the comic Tim, book. Tim, huh? are you talking about the the miscarriage arc? Yeah. Oh, that's not Penny Arcade. That's oh. Control Delete. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Get it right. Oh All my right. God! Wow, how embarrassing! Yeah, for see, you. this is what happens when you try to when you try to slip something yeah. web comic related past Mike. No, this <laughs> happens when it's like it's the two guys who play video games on their couch. <laughs> You know, I'm it's, sorry. It's understandable. There are only about 800 of those strips. So. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's well, like anyway. A soup. Yeah, but um, my Swiss but, cheese memory aside, I think the point stands. Yeah, uh, Dana's sorry, Dana's piano. Now, to be a little churlish, the because um, I do really like this one. I think it's very sweet. I think it's it's very well done. Um, I like the art. I like. I just like it. But um, mm-hmm. but to be churlish, it also has some weird weird narrative structure because it's a it's it's kind of a slice of life thing obviously and life is kind of meandering and doesn't have a you know follow narrative convention but it's also like i i got a cat and also my mom made me take piano lessons and so music is a big part of my life but Mm -hmm. not because i love music i was forced into it and i have a cat that's obsessed with piano music so i have to play piano so it's a little weird when you look at it that way like they didn't quite like they didn't quite you know, yeah, why, they, why are they, 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 it's so tough to write strong female hot redhead college student characters. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I kind of feel that like the cat doesn't really give a shit about the piano or the music. <laughs> like that's kind of so how it's I like read a it. cat. Well, well, yeah, it's, I think it's just the, uh, the 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 girl. She's just imagining that the cat likes the music. Well, like our pets are present in our day to day life. And often are around us whether they like it or not. Um, yeah. And I certainly anthropomorphize my dog quite a bit. Um, I don't think he actually has opinions about what my mom and I watch on television or I don't know, like what's in the mm-hmm. paper. But he's always present for those things. Like 
the cat is mm. always around when when Sarah is playing the piano, but in an affectionate way, you say like, well, you know, the cat the cat loves the piano and loves my music. And it's like, well, it yeah. doesn't really, but it does that matter? Like, what matters is that your pet is there with you throughout your life. Well, the person's yeah. being emotionally moved by this thing that is in their life like the cat is there for you to Im impress emotions upon yes well wow. I, I can't believe this cat is emotionally manipulating her into playing piano <laughs> this is actually really cat. toxic behavior yeah <laughs> <laughs> typical manipulative ass cat now this is also the only uh story where garfield is explicitly female yes so you know that's interesting um, if this was released today, people would lose their fucking minds and, you know, Garfield would get canceled due to woke. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> true, but you know, no, it's the, it, uh, the game, uh, consultancy, uh, studio that worked on this would get. <laughs> oh yeah. I can't believe sweet baby James, right. Like, forced them to put woke. It's not sweet baby James. He's a lawyer, isn't he? Sweet I think it's a barbecue sauce. Sweet barbecue says yeah. sweet baby back ribs or made Garfield woke. Um, oh, we got to start writing these notes down. But I mean, it's it is nice that in 1988, apparently, this could be put in a, a Garfield special uh, without attracting public comment. We we people did not have to have an opinion on Garfield uh, being uh, Garfield being a girl. True. You know. Yeah. Back, you know, we used to be a real country. You could have gender fluid Garfield. Yeah. yeah. Garfield wears many hats. And I think if, if the question is, is would you consider Garfield a trickster figure? Garfield is, is many things. That's that's is the ultimate uh, merit of this Garfield cultural artifact is that he yeah. is adaptable to so many different contexts. That's why he's, he's been so pervasive throughout history. Yeah. All I know is I that... mean, in every culture has a Garfield. Right. Yeah, exactly. All I know is that Odie uh, is a holy fool. True. Yeah. <laughs> now, we do know. Now, Garfield has canonically dated John. That has happened in the strip and um, also in um, one of those, one of those, and it's been referenced in one of those Garfield like books where it's like Garfield's Guide to Partying or something. Because mm. it's like, oh, here's, here's John's like five scariest dates. And it'll be like, you know, he, when he dated a sumo wrestler, when he dated like a, a, a Harley Davidson chick, and one, then one of the ones just Garfield in drag, and it's Garfield thinking like, oh, you owe me for this art buckle. And uh, that is, uh, happened in the strip too, where Dr Gar John is all like, oh, I'm so depressed because I don't have a woman. And Garfield walks off, comes back in wearing a dress and being like, well, okay, for you, John. So, you know, they yeah. have an interesting relationship, Garfield doesn't is what I'm saying. Garfield doesn't have a woman, but he's got a fat pussy at home. No! Hey. One of the things about Diana's piano that is a little subtle that I think is actually one of the more poignant points made in an already overly poignant piece, p p pussy, um, is verging on about, schmaltz. I would argue, yeah, ab about but... about the cat dying. Well, yeah, I mean, anyone who's owned a cat, like Mike says, like you, you relate to it. It is, you know, the story of owning a cat. Where it's like, oh yeah, then I left and I missed my cat because yeah. I known them since I was a kid. Um, the uh, the the frame story of this uh, this old bag is telling, <laughs> <laughs> she's telling her new cat Patches, or at least her other cat Patches, because Diana's passed on. She went through all nine of her lives. Um, she's telling the story, and the cat is on her lap, and you're just kind of grumbling. But then at the end, she's like, would you like me to play something for you, Patches? And the cat, you know, it's like. Rrr. And then and then the woman's like, that's yeah, just as well. <laughs> and you see it's because the woman can't play piano anymore the way she did when she was younger, because she's in her autumn years. And as goes the cat, so goes the woman. Oh, damn. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, Garfield is nine lives. You check out Lab Animal. That one's next. See, <laughs> see, this is why we need that comforting return to the status quo that Garfield brings us. Yeah, of kicking Odie off the counter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I would have expected that, like, after Diana's Piano to have a segment like The Exterminators, which, again, back to status quo. But instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. we get Lab Animal, which is also kind of a, you know, Pulls another a different up direction. punch. Yeah. Um, and honestly, it's I don't know if it's softened a bit 
by the slight shift in art style from the source, source comic. Because it, on the page, it's a fairly realistic <clears throat> cat. But for the special, maybe to, I don't know, dial up the, the pathos, it's you have like a Don Bluth type of cat. Yeah, and if you want yeah, to talk yeah. about cartoon pathos, that's Don Bluth's territory. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very different look. The, 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 the comic in the book, again, that's another one that feels very heavy metal to me. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely, yeah. Especially like the kind of turn at the end, or just like, muhaha. Yep. Yeah. On, just the... that one panel with the the cat morphing into a dog right. against kind of that. D- you know. D- does this predate the um the end of the uh the reveal at the end of the thriller video? It's <laughs> 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 kind of the same thing. Oh, you're right. And yeah, in both the cartoon and the comic, we see Dog Garfield turning toward the viewer uh, and revealing his like glowing cat eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, like it's straight out of a Tales from the Crypt or something. Yeah, I do think that honestly, this this story works in both formats. I, I yeah. think it's pretty good both ways. I I don't know which one I prefer though, because yeah, it's definitely the Don Bluth look is kind of, uh, you know, it, it works really well on the screen, and I think in the the static format of a comic, this well, I guess I should say this is a an, it's a it, they translated it well for the screen, right? Uh, mm-hmm. As opposed to the garden, which suffered when it went to the screen, right? And right, I yeah. Don't... It's it's so, it's solid, even if like most of these segments, it is kind of a, a one note segment. Yeah, and I'm not um, sure. Like speaking of the style, I'm not sure what uh, which is more upsetting. Do you know what I mean? Like, a, is a more do we feel worse seeing a more anthropomorphized cat suffer, or like just a a cat like you would see in your I daily think a life. normal cat because yeah. you can understand like you can see how that maps onto reality whereas a cartoon cat that's like that's a cartoon like it'll, it'll be fine in the next panel like that's can true kill because Kenny, it doesn't matter yeah and that that's true because um you know the 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 cat of the animated cartoon like it has this level of sentience where it like this cat grasps somewhat what is happening to it. It's a, uh, am you know, beyond just like a pure animal reaction of I'm in danger. Um, mm-hmm. It seemed it's had human emotions mapped onto it and to see, and you know, nobody wants to see like a real animal, like suffering on film because, and a big part of that is like the animal is incapable of understanding like the, the context of its situation. Like Which there's a particular, also... there's a particular um, moment in uh, Stephen King's It, uh, the novel, which a pretty grotesque and upsetting uh, vignette of animal abuse, and it's for that exact reason that that the animal doesn't understand what is happening to it, and it still retains a little bit of that dog eagerness to please. Mm. And so mm-hmm. that part of the novel has just stuck in my brain since just because it's so upsetting. But in this case, it's like, oh, well, this is just like, you know, five old Mouskowitz. Like, I, f- I guess I feel bad. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I mean, yeah. I understood this in, yeah, in, in both contexts. Like, Jen, like you say, about you know, under uh, being able to uh, sympathize with the cat being in a situation beyond its control, I mean, are we not in our own ways all subject to forces beyond our understanding, born to test an idea, manifest its effects, and then die? I was on a tear watching this. I mean, you know, <laughs> you can try to escape, you know, like the you know, like the prisoner, but ultimately you find there is no escape. True. We're, we're all just, you know, cats in a lab, if you think about it. Yeah. Oh, man. Someone ought to, ought to write an album about that. All you <laughs> Despite is... all my rage, I'm still just a cat in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all you can do to cope is turn into a dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just like in the, um, uh, yeah, Pink Floyd's The Dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, one they thing did about an album called comic... Animals. <laughs> 
Wait a goddamn There's a, minute. one thing about this comic that's a little strange, or maybe yeah. not, I don't know. Uh, I think it's interesting is that even though the art style is very different and very, very serious, it's like, you know, kind of spooky. Like some of these pictures like that, one of the MP face and shadow kind of pointing a gun right at the viewer is, you know, yeah. pretty, pretty yeah. dark. Um, what I find interesting is that what little dialogue we get in here is still delivered in very standard Garfield type word balloons with that very friendly comic sans font. Yeah. The hmm. Garfield font. Yeah. Yeah. Which seems a little like incongruous. Like I, I'm almost like, wouldn't you, yeah, you're trying to go for an effect. I feel like you should also adapt that to be like, you know, to look like something you'd probably see more in tales from the crypt type comic or something, you know, where yeah, things like that are more like comics. jagged or dripping. Yeah. 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 You know, but, I mean, I, I, you know, on one hand I'm like, Oh, is that, is that, is this a purposeful thing they did to let us know? Like we're still in Garfield territory as bad as everything is here. Remember this is Garfield, but I think they probably just didn't. Yeah. Think remember when it. Garfield, Garfield was turned to a dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I, I don't disagree with Mike's point. I, I He has one. I have a different point. Um, unless I'm mistaken, and I often am, the word balloons show up once at the beginning and then once at the end. You could almost do this without any word balloons. Yeah, no, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, which I think would make it much more impactful. And speaking as Jen uh, remembers one particular segment of the uh, It novels, novel, what I remember... Uh, what stuck with me as a kid the was G.I. Joe an, uh, comic. Yes, thank you, Jen. Issue twenty one, silent interlude. Look that one up. Put in the show notes. There's it's no dialogue sick. throughout the entire comic. Yeah, it's it's a ballsy digression. Just to be like, we're not putting any sound effects. We're not putting any dialogue in this. It is just going to be Snake Eyes who doesn't talk, and you know uh, Scarlet and Storm Shadow. And you're going to learn some interesting things. And it's all going to be told visually. We don't need any words to do this. We can tell a story completely just with you know with uh with the illustrations yep i i, I love that i've told the story enough that jen's like silent interlude yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i wasn't aware of it before i found out about it from you and like then going to look at it myself i'm like damn this is like crazy cool for like a gi joe comic you know especially in the 80s <laughs> when everything was based on a toy line and like yeah, the... it, was, it was pretty stupid stuff. It was like Garfield level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and I'm confusing because I'd mentioned the um, the title of Lab Animal. That's not Lab Animal. That is one that was very similar in the comic that was Primal Self. Right. V very similar to, to Lab Animal. That's the, the cat remembering that it's like, oh, basically I'm an apex predator and I react by killing things that are smaller than me. Very cat-like. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pr Prim yeah, Primal Self was the one that really fucked people up uh, when they saw it. And this one actually, again, it's it's got very little dialogue. Um, I think actually, the what little dialogue uh, they they do have in it is pretty important. So this mm -hmm. one it works better here than in a uh, Lab Animal. Um, but uh, this one is yeah, I think this is the one that really sticks with people more than anything else. Um, yeah, because it's basically this, a, this demonic predator that then attacks yeah. an old woman, which, you know, a cat will do when it's bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that reminds me, today, uh, today, Mike, your wife sent me a video of one of your cats uh, absolutely entranced by a crane fly like high up on a wall oh yeah sandy he, he's a predator yes yeah he's he's good he's he's a mighty hunter <laughs> <laughs> yeah like uh it, you know it's basically just the cat being transfixed by this uh this small creature and i think my reply to it was like oh he wants to murder <laughs> <laughs> he's like he dreams all day of murder <laughs> um a tiny thing is moving i must destroy it <laughs> yeah <laughs> And, um, you know, the thing about this segment is, you know, every because everyone's like, oh, my God, he, like, killed that old lady. And it's like, okay, well, it's a house cat. Like, it's possible that he definitely bit her and clawed her. But really, I think the horrifying ending to this segment is that he attacked his owner. Uh, she sustained some skin damage. Oh, God, here we go. And mm -hmm. then she went and had her cat put to sleep because it's violent. Mm. That's the real ending. No, uh, I, geez, I thought 
we're going for a typical gen ending which is and then the the woman has an infection and she goes to the hospital and she never really recovers and then she dies at home alone and then the then the cats eat her corpse and that's how her body uh is uh dealt with after she's no longer alive and i just think that's interesting i thought that you were going to say that i was going to give a queer reading of this segment no, we know how we know about your morbid fixations. Like it's going to be about oh, and then like if you die, like a cat will eat your face and eat your fingers. Did you know that, Tim? Yes. <laughs> well, podcast you hear all these same stories. I suppose that's well, one outcome, but mm-hmm. I mean, you well, know, if you're uh, if you're into that sort of thing, as Tim seems to be, and you are. <laughs> yeah, like well, you did seem very excited relating the story, Tim. I'm doing an impression of you because I know how you are. Mm -hmm. I I know, I know what you're like. Okay, fine. Try to deflect. We all know the (laughs) truth. Well, I think there's a couple of things about this story. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think this is a very effective little like horror um, vignette. Mm. Um, It's the, the style is, it's an interesting, it's not quite as stark as the lab animal one. It's actually, um, I, I don't know how to describe it it's kind of a uh it's it, it's very garish compared to lab animal i feel like this is almost almost a little more giallo you might say um or ec comics but um yeah but you know because yeah this is garfield he's a he's a regular house cat it seems and then some primal force uh reminds him of his ancestry back in prehistoric times when he was a cave cat you know and <laughs> cave cat is reasserting itself and he attacks and kills an old lady. Um, I actually, cause you can even see a, once uh, one of the panels shows the modern cat with his like, um, you know, a uh, paw with retracted claws touching the, um, the yeah, kind of like reaching paw. through the mirror in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the, the claws the that have the starry void in them. They're touching like, uh, like Adam and God in that, painting or yeah, something it's, it's the cosmic horror garfield <laughs> yeah this is uh this is uh <laughs> you know Gar- garfield embraces the void um but uh, i have a theory about this okay is it queer okay um no actually it is it could be, <laughs> it could be interpreted that way uh but here's the thing is i i have always chosen to believe that garfield kills the the cat kills the old lady right 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 with you okay well, here's the thing. So this this uh, this is Garfield's nine lives. So each of these represents. That means that Garfield has died nine times, right? Mm-hmm. In every story, he dies. Right now, um, in the first story, Cave Cat, we saw him get killed. You know, uh, Odie drops a big tree on him. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the other stories, we don't see him die, right? But right, we know yeah. that Garfield does die. These are Garfield's stories of his lives. So my theory. Is Garf the cat is not always Garfield. Garfield is whatever character in the story dies, because then he gets reincarnated. <laughs> so that means that in this story, Garfield is not the cat; he's the old lady. Oh, oh, all right. Oh shit! <laughs> that is a long walk, and I'm not sure I'm. Uh, I, I follow you, but I understand <laughs> what you're getting at. Yeah, because like in the Exterminator story, Garfield mm-hmm. is the mouse that gets eaten. Oh. Um, <laughs> All, all think, Garfield like, stories are ultimately about death, is what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. um, now, I'm not Todd. sure. Yeah, yeah oh, exactly. So Uncle Todd is is Garfield. <laughs> he, yeah, because right. so he replaces the represents the death. Yeah, <laughs> replace yep. the, the T and Todd with the G of Garfield, and what do you get? Whoa! Think about it. Yeah. Um, in in uh, Babes and Bullets, Garfield is not actually Sam Spade. He is actually Professor Otabi the victim of the murder that Garfield is trying to solve or not, that Sam Spade is trying to solve. Yeah. I mean, he's not called Garfield. He's called Sam Spade. Must be a different character. Duh. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, <laughs> now I'm not sure exactly who Garfield is in the Viking story. Cause you know, I don't, I don't see anyone die there, but you know, well, they die of old age. There you, there you yeah, go. That must be it. Well, surely um, somebody died when they were pillaging uh, St. Paul. Cause they were being, yeah, there you go. Judging by yeah. the art. Well, they are Vikings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was during the winter. They just froze to death. Um, <laughs> the uh, the cat touching like the the spirit of cat ness in um it it in the primal self 
uh, story also kind of reminds me of Grant Morrison's run on Animal Man, where it's like, mm. hey, buddy, you're actually a comic book character, and I'm the guy writing the comic book, and um, I just want you to know that. So, like, there are forces that are bigger than you that you're a part of, but, like, you're you exist in the smaller context of uh, this thing so i just uh i thought i'd blow your mind and, and mention that you're being read by people as a book it's like <laughs> oh <laughs> okay that's such a fun run of that comic it's yeah it's a, it's a real mind fuck um yeah. I don't and get you know morrison haters that that well, would remind me of put me in the, uh, the put me in the mind of garfield gets real where garfield knows that he's a comic character. Yeah. Have you guys seen that one? I have not. No, but go go ahead. Okay, I need to explain this, okay, very quickly. <laughs> so the concept for Garfield Gets Real, Garfield is a comic character. He lives in a comic character universe, right? Mm -hmm. So he's in a universe where, like, Blondie and Dagwood are walking around and all that shit. Um, Garfield, John, and Odie are roommates, and they all work at the comic strip factory. So they drive to work... They stand in front of a big machine that takes their picture and superimposes <laughs> uh, word balloons on them, right? Makes sense. Uh, yeah. then, Ooh, Fumetti style. Right. Then the machine broadcasts the comic strip into our universe. Uh, so they show, like, in our universe, like, a paperboy delivers a newspaper, and as newspaper falls on your front porch, the comics just magically just appear in the paper. So... You know, they aren't drawn by cartoonists. The newspaper is just like, I don't know where these are coming from. They just appear on the page. But, you know, whatever. We'll go with it. It's a um, force of nature. Yeah. And but then there's more because Garfield also has the ability to use the machine to watch through his comic anyone who's reading his comic. So and he's all like, OK, a uh, switch, you know, click, click the button. You can like scan through different Garfield comics. So at any point that you're reading a Garfield comic, he might be watching you do that. You don't know if he's doing it or not. It's a literal panopticon, but like he has that ability. <laughs> um, and finally Garfield, he, he comes into our universe because he sees a hot dog vendor and you know, Garfield loves hot dogs. Mm. So he jumps through the machine, the screen to get into our universe, but he can't return because the comic strip universe is pressurized like an airplane cabin. So as soon as he goes into ours, it punctures that and the comic strip universe kind of all gets stuff gets getting sucked out. So they have to plug up that hole and then Garf, you know, they can't get Garfield back. So that's the big, you and know, th that's the big thing. That hence they the do. inception of Garfield without Garfield. The, yes. That was the fallout from that. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, he had to, like, Jim Davis, like, I need to explain this. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that is that is uh, Garfield Gets Real. I'm not and, just making um, stuff up. Like, this is all canonically, it, it hangs together. In a, <laughs> this a is, yeah, this narrative. is all canon. Yeah, yeah. And keep in mind that Garfield's pet force takes place in another alternate universe. Because in the comic strip universe where Garfield lives, he can go down to his corner store and buy a comic book, which shows... Garfield's pet force so he can there's another universe where that is real and yeah it's it's yeah. the green it, it's uh, Alan Moore's swamp thing yeah it's it's it's, it's very meta you know I love that anyway, the, this, this cat archetype that he types into that he taps into and represents it's it's you know it's a dream and death and Sandman and all that <laughs> yeah <laughs> It, has there been a Garfield Sandman crossover? Jen, do you want to ask Neil Gaiman on Blue Sky if uh, if Garfield exists in the Sandman universe? I don't or know. Like, does Sandman maybe, exist in Garfield's? Maybe Mike should ask for, via Midnight Pals because I know Gaiman might actually pay attention to that. Uh, Ga Gaiman, I gotta say, he is the world. He is like the world's most patient kindergarten teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really true. I mean, like, uh. literally 90% of the people interacting with him on Blue Sky are just like, uh, is there, a, in Sandman, is there a way to get out of the wizard's dungeon without the key? And he's like, oh, I'm very <laughs> glad you asked that question. <laughs> yeah. We, we've we been going all over the place, uh, quantum leaping from Garfield body to Garfield body, uh, yeah. looking for our way back to our home comic strip. And the closest that Garfield's Nine Lives gets is with the segment entitled Garfield, 
Yes. <laughs> Which is sort of the prime Garfield. It's the uh, into the Garfield versus uh, sort of home home turf. Do yeah, we get a, is, um... a sexier John like uh, Marissa Tomei, Aunt May? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm Pretty afraid sexy. that John sucks just like he always did. Yeah, John yeah. is kind of he's he's the one constant. He's sort of the the Jerry of Rick and Morty. He's always going to be John no matter where you go. Yeah, just yeah. a perfect incel. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, so this this strip is like uh, it it vaguely brings in some of it, you know some of the information we got from I think Garfield out in the town, the one where Garfield meets his mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it tells us a little, I think it also there, do we, about Garfield meeting Odie, I think, I don't know if there's anything else that talks about how they first got Odie. Well, that's a, it. it's yeah, a little bit kind of, of a, like a prequel. It's a little bit of a retcon because, um, as Garf heads know, um, Odie was originally the pet of John's roommate, Lyman. Mm. That's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Who one day um, disappeared with, like, under mysterious circumstances. I thought he moved in yes. with Jack and Chrissy in Santa Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. Um, <laughs> well, <my> actually, theory, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, I think this is one that I developed uh, with your wife, Mike, because uh, your wife pointed out that uh, Garfield has big old Tomcat jowls, uh, mm-hmm. implying that he is not a neutered male. And I think that's supported in the text because as you see in the comic, Garfield frequently goes out on the town with Arlene. So, Garf- and he just pisses all over the place. That's right. Garfield yeah. is horny. And I think that what happened with Lyman is that Lyman got so sick of living in that house with a tomcat that just fucking pissed everywhere. The whole place stank <laughs> of cat piss. And John was used to it. He was nose blind at that point. And Odie didn't care because he's a dog. He's like, oh boy, it smells like piss in here all the time. I love it. <laughs> Is this why John doesn't get a lot of second dates? <laughs> it does make sense. Yeah. So Lyman moved out, leaving his dog in disgust because probably yeah. the dog smelled like piss at that point too like john well, i think like the problem has been in front of you this whole time it's been right under your nose mm-hmm. mm. well and john doesn't why, have a nose which makes it hard and yeah, that's yeah. why john you're blind to it and that's why john couldn't get laid in a brothel with a fistful of hundreds he smelled of cat piss. <laughs> right yeah the segment isn't really about that um <laughs> It's the backstory, no. yeah. It's the backstory of Garfield, how he meets Odie. John adopts him, and then Garfield, as a cat, just proceeds to be a demanding asshole. Mm-hmm. He's abusive and imposing. So, Yay. I mean, any cat owner can relate. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's how they be. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is. Uh, I mean, this. This is again. This this is a uh, kind of a trifle, but it's like we're back on Garfield home turf, so I guess that you know you had to have this sort of thing in it. Yeah, we saw Garfield be injected with an experimental serum and turn into a wear dog. <laughs> like yeah. let's 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 get him back to kicking Odie. And the joke in this segment is that Garfield says that in his current life, his current incarnation, he is found to be a little bit lacking, and it's like. You are such a cunt, Garfield. Like, yeah, exactly. You, you have the great. cushiest life ever. Like you, you could be a, an ex, a lab experiment. Like, you could be living in some kind of psychedelic nightmare world. You could be uh, beheaded by the king of England. Yeah. Stupid yeah, but no, you cat. get lasagna all the time. Typical so, fucking again, cat. Yeah, like, totally a, like an average grateful. cat. Yeah. He loves his lasagna. <laughs> lasagna cat. <laughs> Ooh. And the uh, the the story in the book is it pretty much tracks with the uh, with the segment on the animated special. Yeah, and can I just point out how funny it is that uh, John in the special is voiced by an actor called Tom Huge. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's so... a giant in the industry. <laughs> Tom Tom Huge is an interesting story because he is the standard voice actor for John. He was John in all the specials and in the uh, uh, Garfield and Friends series. Um, you will never see him voice any other character ever than John. 
And mm. the reason for that is he's not actually a professional voice actor. He is one of Jim Davis's frat brothers. God. Really? Yep. I'll yep. be damned. Oh, there it is. God, that is such great I mean, job security. I met the wrong people in college, that, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll say this. Would... He's good as John. He's actually good at the job. But yeah. Yeah. You know, he's not like the fucking Peanuts kids. No. <laughs> yeah. It's Space, Space Cat. Space Cat opens with a grab bag of classic sci-fi premise cliches, which I do think is on purpose. It's like, may you live long and explore strange final frontiers to boldly go with you. <laughs> Something. It's so. cold outside. There's no kind of atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Things like that. <laughs> it does feel um, a lot like Red Dwarf. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, no, it's very, it feels very Red Dwarf or Hitchhiker's Guide. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. Probably more Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide. Guide. Um, yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide is an interesting um, call out too because we're talking about Garfield uh, existing in all these different contexts, all these different potential realities when really that is ultimately the, the, um, the, the, the final arc of the hitchhiker's guide book is about all the different variations of of earth across different um what multiverse mm -hmm. instances and of course the ending of it you'll be like oh you say uh, douglas adams had depression <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> but yeah you have all these different lives all these different instances of um of garfield existing in a way that there are all these different earths that exist in this Hitchhiker's Guide universe until you know their waveform ultimately collapses. Where's it going with this? Uh, yeah, it's it's got a little bit of Hitchhiker's Guide tone to it. Uh, all the different lives because it is Garfield in his last life, which I'm like, oh, if, when he dies, like he's done. I'm like, is that like, like what happens to to Doctor Who when he uh, transforms for his thirteenth time? Is it the same thing that happens to Garfield? I'm I'm, I'm just asking questions here. I haven't. Um, you know, I actually don't know because I haven't followed Doctor Who in like about ten years, so I you're about four doctors you. behind. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no. I mean, he I just I, I kind of quit when when David Tennant left the show. Right, because you didn't find the guy after him as hot. No, I mean, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, also the show got like the show got a different showrunner and got even stupider. Uh, was that uh, after Stephen Moffat, or was that Stephen? No, Moffitt? that was Moffat. Oh, that <laughs> a sucks. fine a fine writer in his lane, maybe mm -hmm. not the best showrunner. Well, but he did write some of the best episodes of New Who. So, but so we're we've talking got about cat. another iconic character. <laughs> yeah, this cat <laughs> is lost in sp adrift, locationless. <laughs> I'll put one in the swear jar in space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he is lost in space he's like yeah some people go boldly and whatever i'm me i don't know what i'm doing but it turns out it's all an experiment to see what a cat is going to do right before it dies which i think the russians already had experiments like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a creepypasta about it right yeah yeah when they weren't it seemed like to be a series on shutter when they weren't cutting off dogs heads they were putting cats to death <laughs> right yeah um, yeah, so, I mean, they could have just, uh, sent it into space and had it have heat stroke and die in a panic. Oh. <laughs> Yield, yielding valuable scientific data. I think they're, mm. I think they do evoke Leica in this segment, at least in the comic. Oh, I oh don't, do they? Huh. I don't recall that. I, I mean, it's, that. it's the future, so Odie is a computer, and of course it gives, you can give it verbal commands and it spits out useless answers, so, <laughs> predating Siri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um this one's okay yeah <laughs> it's it's like hey we've we've sat through eight of these Let's just bring us home garfield yeah it's uh um, yeah i think they did a good job of replicating the art style and mm -hmm. from the comic and that's about it yeah i i feel like this is i mean this again it's like it feels like this could be part of garfield and friends and it's just like Look, mm -hmm. if you're going to do a sci-fi story, you really you really did not make full use of the uh, concept. You, you didn't fulfill the promise of the premise, you know? They, they had clones in zero gravity, and that's about it. Yeah, and they did yeah. expand on the, the 
the story on the page a little bit because um, in the in the comic, Odie is just in computer form, but in the animated special, we get actual physical universe Odie who clones himself and then goes off in little Odie pods to try to help Garfield, only to chase after a fire hydrant. Because dogs, yeah, there's yeah. one weakness. Yeah, yeah, it is a fleet of attack dogs. And Jen, <laughs> you'll appreciate this that what seems like they're getting into just like fighter jets, but you notice that when they're distracted, the uh, th- the vessels move like the dogs themselves. So they aren't really ships, but power armor. So Oh, dog max. The- yeah, so that the dogs sit in. <gasps> they're sitting in the robots. Yes. Just like, just like Robotech. <laughs> yeah, just like in Robotech, that cartoon famous for... People sitting in the giant robots. Uh, Tim, I think you mean that <laughs> anime. I just Why feel like is there Gar- not an a Garfield anime in this? Perhaps Look, if they remade Gar- it. Garfield is gonna sit there with his reflective eyes and his fingers steepled and be like, "Odie, you have to pilot the uh, the Evangelion." <laughs> Odie, get in the dog mech, or Arlene will have to do it, or no, Nomo will have to do it. <laughs> Normal uh, Ayanami. Cat in the shell. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think that, or, or fortunately, I'm not sure which. Um, mm. 1988 was a, was a little bit early for, um, a little bit ahead of the pervasive anime influence on animation. I mean, this is like pre-Ren and Stimpy, so. Well, yeah, I mean, Ren and Stimpy really blew the doors off of uh, animation. Yes. Yeah, what a great yeah. anime. <laughs> uh, it's called Japanimation. Right, yeah, come on. <laughs> Proper term, Jen. Uh, yeah, and then um, he dies, and just like uh, Animal Man in the Grant Morrison run, he meets his creator. Yeah. So it's it, it gets a little weird. It gets a little out there. Um, and garfield is reincarnated he gets all his lives back there's you know some something to be said maybe in uh an alan moore comic uh, about you know the cyclical nature of narrative and the way that this starts over and over again the story that has no end it's an endless cycle of death and rebirth and the comforting return to the status quo a yes yeah endlessly rebooted yeah the there is something about this ending that I thought was kind of fascinating uh, because it kind of answered oh, uh, uh, it answered something that I had noticed about this special, um, which is that in throughout Garfield's nine lives, uh, we see Odie return in different forms in different lives, right? We see him as Big Bob and Cave Cat. We see him as one of the dogs in uh, King Cat. He's in... Um, obviously in Garfield and he's in space cat. I think a few he's a, oh, they're, uh, he might be in others. I can't remember. Um, but um, uh, we never, see, we only see John in Garfield. Uh, we never see John appear in anything else. I, w- I would have expected him as like the Pharaoh or something in King cat, but Nope. We, we only see John that one time. Yeah. John is and, mortal. Um, and he returns to dust. Yeah. And that's the thing is that, so we know that Garfield is nine lives, but everyone else only gets one. But at the end of the special, both Garfield and Odie are dead. And God says, uh, Garfield pleads for his life. And God sends him back and says, and um, also well, because God says the computers Jim are Davis. down. Jim Davis is <laughs> yeah. all like, I don't know what life you have. What life are you on? And Garfield like, is my first life. So he gets all nine lives again. And um, he says, is Odie a cat? And Garfield uh, says, yes, o- Garfield lies on behalf of Odie, that Odie's a cat. So now Odie gets nine lives. So mm. they get to live them all over again. And the cyclical nature of reality, that means that we are watching the retcon version where Odie has now b- become part of Garfield's past lives. Because originally, since he's a dog, he was not in those original lives. Okay, so we're in sort of the time travel paradox where Odie is a, is a cat despite not being a cat yes okay. he is a um odie is a theoretical cat yes he yeah he exists as a non-cat mass yes in potentia so but like we're watching we're, we are watching the altered timeline where odie is now a cat 
because if we watch this, you know, because they, they changed history. It's like trying to go. It's like in uh, Back to the Future where it's like you can't go to the mm -hmm. that up. After they change the timeline, you can't go back to the other future now because Biff has altered it. You yeah, know, you have to go back. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah, have to go back in time. So, the, but yeah, so has anyone considered a uh, Chris Nolan Garfield movie? <laughs> Garception. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's se it's in seventy millimeter and it's three hours long. Yeah, Gar <laughs> Garfield goes back and becomes his own father. And Florence Pugh is nude in it. <laughs> Garfield's his own grandpa. Right. What I got from the ending of the special is that Garfield and Odie have yet to break the cycle of Samsara. <laughs> <laughs> they are the yin and the yang, yes. Yeah. They they have not no, they have not achieved Nirvana. No, well, you know, it they, is his attachment well, to lasagna. Lasagna yeah. Nirvana, yeah. It's... Actually, no, I'm sorry. I, uh, Jen, I have to correct you here. <laughs> okay. Please, because do. at the end, I'm sorry, in the last one, Garfield go dies. He goes to meet his, uh, uh, meet Jim Davis, his creator, and he specifically asks to be sent back. So Garfield has made a choice. Garfield is a bodhisattva. Oh. <laughs> that, yeah, you know, honestly, that tracks. Uh, yeah, okay. he's intentionally foregoing nirvana in order to lead us to a better place so these are the nine lives of the buddha yes yeah <laughs> and and garfield is fat so that's another point well yep, i think there I've, you go. I've exhausted my knowledge of buddhism over the last mm -hmm. 10 minutes so sure why not well i think buddha i think one of the the um one of the great uh zen koans of buddha is that the best defense is a good offense <laughs> <laughs> true well yeah, yeah yeah the uh the buddha was also a great college football coach <laughs> a lot of clever aphorisms you know i get help, help. buddha mixed up with john wooden all the time <laughs> well yeah they have all those buddhist quotes at the uh john buddha center at uh on ucla <laughs> campus well before uh we close is there anything else we would like to say about garfield his nine lives um, I think this stands out as, um, even though it's, it's a weird, it's a very weird thing. And obviously each of these, uh, segments, both in the cartoon and in the comic strip, if you just read them in isolation are not very impressive. I think the, um, the gestalt of this project is really weird and out there. And I think it's, uh, probably one of Jim Davis's, you know, um, maybe his magnum opus. It's definitely his you know, um, his uh, most interesting project that he's done. I think that sums it up pretty well. What about you, Tim? Uh, you know how people get mad when, like, they uh, force diversity into, like, Marvel characters? <laughs> this, I mean, this it's just an iteration of the same. When someone's like, well, Garfield isn't a, a panther. He's not a, a detective. What are you supposed to be, Orange? Why the fuck is Garfield <laughs> black? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in um in Gar actually in Garfield in disguise, he does uh dress up as a black cat at one point, which is really problematic cuz Garfield is doing brownface. That's true. Yeah. Well. Garfield's Nine Lives is probably the best Garfield um special. Babes and Bullets is, you know, close second and then Garfield in disguise. Um after that, I think they're all pretty okay. Diminishing um, returns. This, this is kind of yeah. like you know how like other countries have like their own like rogues gallery of muppets on sesame street mm -hmm. and yeah. you're just like what what is this but everyone's just like <laughs> well obviously this is that purple guy that everyone loves that teaches kids about how to not get aids and you're like uh, <laughs> <laughs> like if this is real like yeah what's what's wrong with you so we're kind of dipping into each one of these uh situations like we we have only experienced garfield as the fat orange comic strip character but think of anyone else who's like oh it's the the hard-bitten detective from those uh pulp noir stories but then they made him into like this asshole who sits at home and kicks a dog right. <laughs> who who's the weirdo here in the uh the u universe where sam spade is is what you get in the you get uh a dick tracy version of garfield yeah yeah imagine garfielding dick tracy it's uh it's all culturally uh, re relative. Like, there's no 
objective truth uh, in all that. Not if Warren well, Beatty has I, anything to say about it. Right. Well, I was going to well, say, yeah, if, it would be great if we lived in the universe where Warren Beatty um, <laughs> like made a, uh, a live-action Garfield movie <laughs> using prosthetics and lighting to achieve the effect of a Garfield. And Al Pacino played Odie. <laughs> what I'm if you a did a fucking movie... dog! <laughs> what if you did a movie where you got Bill Murray to play Garfield? Can you imagine? Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, you can get two extra episodes every month, plus access to our growing catalog of reviews for just $5 a month by going to patreon.com and searching for Have You Seen This? Tim speeding too. He's on Adderall. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to clean my entire apartment after no, I this. I don't I don't think Tim is on Adderall right now, but No, I'm just doing coke.